Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, I'm anyway. Time, yeah, I'm, good, on, mate. I'm skating on the thinnest <laughs> ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch-long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out and on. I know it's a black man. I'm, yeah. I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Gaz Farum, welcome to the Nash Podcast, mate. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Anytime, mate. I'm excited. You were the first podcast that I edited. I did not interview you. It was Dan and Alfie. It was a long one as well, wasn't it? I think it was about three and a bit hours, purely because of Dan's love for you, man, <laughs> which is pretty intense. It's mutual. Well, love Dan as well. You've got to say that really because you're here. But <laughs> he was trying to fight his way in today from a shoot, probably to do this interview instead of me. But I'm glad that he's not made it. So uh, <laughs> how have you been recently, mate? What have you been up to? Yeah, really good. Really good. Um, busy, as always. Um, always seem to be busy, despite the fact that I, tr- I sort of, you know, try and maintain a nice kind of like calm sort of, Laid back life, just everything always ends up being manic, mate, and busy. Um, joys of working for yourself, I suppose, isn't it? Always, yeah. always a thousand things to do, but yeah, no good. Um, obviously, just published the uh third of the subsurface magazines, yeah, so that's been keeping me entertained for the last eight to ten weeks, I suppose, doing all the editorial work on that, all the proofing, um, you know, all the like sales marketing launch side of it and all that sort of stuff as well so unfortunately that sort of coincided with the best part of spring as well for fishing and Plan trouble with, well. with print deadlines and stuff as well it just kind of, it kind of like has to be done by a certain time as well so yeah spring was a bit of a difficult one fishing wise to be honest last year probably had my best spring ever i reckon actually last year really good trip to france um Caught a load of good ones. Caught a load of good ones back home from Stone Acres. Just like everything fell into pace, like beautifully Perfect. last spring. Yeah, and, and I published the first of the mags at the same time as well. So it was like everything just seamlessly seemed to like drop together like clockwork. It was great. Just kept turning up at lakes, and even if they were busy, it was like the one empty area. Just like you know, oh look, there's what I, I don't know. Like everything just fell into place. This year, I think I've probably fished considerably better than I did last year. And it pretty much got nothing to show for it. Mm, the swings and roundabouts of big carp fishing. It's big carp fishing, isn't it? Like people don't see that side of it generally. Well, we're going to delve into obviously your angling. We're going to sort of pick up from where the last podcast ended off. So when the last podcast that you came in with Dan and Alf, you were talking about, I think we were just at the end of the pandemic times and you were doing a few tutorials yeah, that was it. abroad. And we're basically going to pick up from that. So if anybody wants your historic chapters, they can go back to that episode because there's loads of mega stuff in there from Reads Me, Yately, the likes of, mate. But we're going to talk, I think we're going to go Stonies because you've referenced it to start with, mate. That's where you've been doing sort of your fishing at the moment. You've talked about these two springs. UK fishing-wise, Stone Acres, mm-hmm. why there, mate? Um... I don't know, really. I mean, I, I, like a couple of reasons, I suppose. One, I think I've often been drawn over the years uh, to lakes where I feel like, for whatever reason, I've got some kind of connection to them. Okay. Not necessarily just that they've got a 50-pounder in or they've got, like, 20, 40s in or, or, or whatever. Like, I often seem to end up fishing places that either sort of, like, um, I don't know, like... I'm really good friends with someone that's fished there before and perhaps I've spent a bit of time chatting to them about the place, seen their pictures, kind of like got to know a little bit about the place beforehand. Or for example, like Yately, I just read all those stories as a kid growing up, really wanted to go and fish there and like just something about it had sparked the interest. Like there's so many big fish out there these days, Mm. but there's not that many places that I'm like, I really want to go and fish there. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, Stone Acres was 
like Oxford was like a bit of a gateway for the northern lads to the southern scene, I suppose, naturally, because it's like, it is a gateway. It's like right in the middle of the country, isn't yeah. it? And it's like halfway down almost before you get to the sort of, you know, Surrey, Reading, London, Con Valley, all them sort of waters. You know, Oxford, still a long way from Manchester. Mm. But Oxford, I suppose, is much more reachable than a lot of those other southern lakes. Um, and yeah, uh, a few of the northern lads, obviously Rob Gillespie, who you had on not long ago. Yeah, uh, and Rob. A few of the other northern lads, Chris Wynn Stanley, um, Brian the Miner, mm-hmm. um, Mark the Bull, uh, a couple of those other lads that fished reeds major during the same years that I did, um, had started going down and fishing stonies early to sort of mid two thousands. So kind of that was the that was the connection. Inevitably, spent a lot. You know, you spend a lot of time, don't you, when you sat around at a lake just chewing yeah. the fat, drinking tea, whatever, just chatting with lads. And um, yeah, Stone Acres was always sort of somewhere that just kept cropping up, you know, um, we talked about it a lot. The fishing just always sounded fascinating as well. Like there's not too many lakes where you can legally and legitimately spend as many hours a day as you want floating around in the boat, you know, head over the side through a scope, looking at the lake bed placing rigs, seeing what's going on. Like just the fishing always just sounded fascinating as well. Some of the stories like Rob's stories about raking the swims and yeah, what he was seeing in terms of spots getting turned over and stuff. I was always like, fuck, that sounds fascinating. Like A, the fish are incredible. I think them old Oxford ones have always been some of the most revered carp in the country. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They're dark, they're scaly, they're big. classic shapes as well like them big long like three three and a half foot long linears and stuff like yeah there's never been too many of them made has there you know and there's certainly not really that many of them left kicking around not 30 40 year old ones anyway Mm. um so yeah so i suppose it was a combination of things really in honesty i never really thought i'd go and fish there because i always looked at it as the kind of place that needed two three four nights a week yeah and it had always had that reputation like because of the boat set up, because of the nature of the fishing, because it's hard, really difficult fishing as well. You know, the thought of turning up for a single night or like even two nights just never really felt like a realistic or sensible proposition. I was always like, ah, it's just not, it's just not the one. Do you know what I mean? You need to commit, I think, to them sort of waters. Um, and yeah, last year um, I'd had my name down for a couple of years. I can't remember why I put it down. Um it was one of them, a couple of conversations or something. And yeah, I'd yeah. put my name down and, um, yeah, got offered the ticket. And I sort of thought it's probably the only time in my life really where I actually thought, do you know what? I've probably got the time to commit to we it. Were, yeah. We were talking about this just before the camera. You, in sort of post pandemic time, maybe just before you had been through a pretty wholesale change with regards to you and your life, weren't you? You were teaching and then you'd stepped away from teaching. Yep. And then become yeah. sort of, oh, you did a few tutorials, but then you also sort of were angling pretty much as the mainstay of your income, weren't you? We're, along with subsurface, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, that's a big old change in terms of time. Yeah, massive. Available. I mean, I mean, when I was teaching, um, like a lot of my fishing was 12 hour overnighters. Yeah. You know, like one night a week, um, sometimes two. Like, I, and I never used to do much fishing in the holidays either. Did you not? No, because A, there'd always be like a stack of marking and stuff you'd have to do because you could never do it during ty- like term time. So if you had like a week, say, um, holiday or like Easter, you get two weeks or whatever. Yep. Um, usually a week of that would be taken up with schoolwork. And then actually what I would do was instead of going and fishing whatever English syndicate or whatever I was doing, I'd started doing the trips to Belgium and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I always used to think, oh, I can go away, I can have four nights fishing somewhere beautiful, probably catch a few, have a lovely time, come back feeling recharged, as opposed to just going and sitting and doing four nights on whatever syndicate it was I was fishing at the time, be that like Yately or Roach Pit or, you know, kind of wherever else. So, um, yeah, whereas last year I was like, I can actually commit a bit of time to this. Um, Not all year, but I was like, I reckon I've got a few little windows where I can you know, wedge a few trips together and try and string something together. I think where I've been fishing for a long time now, you know, 30 odd years, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, You know, and I've seen a lot of lakes and I've been around a lot of lakes and I've sort of 
been friends with a lot of lads that have also fit. So it's a big network of stuff that I've been in contact with over the years. And I think I can, I can look at a lake now and understand what you'd need to do to be successful on there pretty quickly and pretty easily, you know? And I think a lot of the time I'll look at somewhere and I'll just think, I just can't give that what is going to be required. Um, so rather than doing a half baked job, I sort of think it's just not for me. Do you know what I mean? I just won't, I won't really think about it. You know, there's plenty of lakes like that where I look at, I'd, I'd love to go and fish there. What do you mean? Give me an example. Give me some ways just to know. Well, I'd always looked at stone acres exactly right. like that. Do you know what I mean? I'd always thought there's no point in me taking a stoney's ticket because I can't go and fish three nights a week mm-hmm. um, and sort of do that fairly consistently. So I was like, I, I know what'll happen. It'll just, I'll just get frustrated and it'll, it will just burn me because I won't be able to do what I know is required. Like I don't, even though I'm, I like, I like to think of myself as like pretty laid back, chilled kind of, kind of guy. But when I fish, I like to fish 100%. Yeah. Uh, and I hate not doing things as well as I feel like I possibly can. Well, like I hate knowing what I need to do, but not being able to do it. For you are reason. defo a perfectionist, mate, isn't you? When it comes to your work or whatever you're doing or producing, you're that's defo in you. I don't Pre- think I don't. I'd like. I think perfectionism can be pretty da- like a, like true perfectionism is a bit of a dangerous trait. Maybe not to because that extreme, but there's a particular. In I there. just like to do things as well as I feel yeah. like I possibly can. Um, and I think when you've been fishing for a long time, you just know what needs to be done. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, like you can walk around the lake and you can look at it and you can, you know, certain lakes fish will spend a lot of time in certain areas. And if say, for, so like Rockford, for example, like there was a spell on there where there was only really a couple of swims doing the fish. Yep. Uh, you just couldn't really get in them swims. You know, I was only really doing a night a week because of the mega range work and stuff like that. I was, I did a few um, overnighters and stuff and I was just like, I'm just wasting my time. I'm genuinely just wasting my time here because I'm spending like three or four hours getting my rods out at 170, 180 yeah. or whatever. And then I'm winding in pretty much before bite time in the morning. and I can't really get in the areas where I need to be anyway if I'd been able to turn up on a different day of the week or had like three nights I could string together or, or whatever, it would have been a different, different, different ball game. But so, yeah, I'm just a little bit more conscious these days of, of not burning myself by putting myself in a situation that's not going to work. For yeah, me, no, fair do. If dude. that makes sense. Fair do. Um, Stoney's itself, you, you got the ticket. What what your initial thoughts with regards to the place? For, for people who haven't seen it, give it, give us a context of sort of overall size and, I, and sort of stock. Yeah, so it's I think it's 50 odd acres. I think they, it's somewhere between 50 and 60 acres. Okay. I don't know the exact, like 50, 55 maybe. But it feels big because it's basically a big rectangle. Okay. So it feels like a big lake to start with. Um, it's got an island about two thirds of the way down. Um, average is probably like eight to 12 foot deep. Um, tap clear through from probably October until about April, mm-hmm. early May. It's tap clear and then it, it, it loses viz. Um, and summer sort of, it never goes pea green, but you can't see the bottom. Right. Basically. Um, mega weedy, mm-hmm. loads of naturals tiny spots um, where you've been allowed to boat drop for years now as well. I think you've been allowed to boat drop. I was chatting to Scott Lloyd about it the other day and I think like, sure he said about seven or eight years now you've been allowed right. to boat drop. So whereas back in the day, like when little Rob fished it, you had to drop blocks, but you had to cast, cast still. Yeah. So the lads inevitably were fishing much, much bigger spots, like to hit a spot, even as big as this room mm. at like 120 yards, is, you know, like if you put a block either side of this room, went back to the bank and tried to chuck at it, you'd be very surprised at how easy it is to yeah, to, to not get it on that perfect. spot. Yeah. yeah. Um, or you think, yeah, that, like, it'll land like plumb between the two blocks. You row out there and you're like, <laughs> where's my rig? Do you know what I mean? Because of the swing in, the drop, or whatever, yeah. like, or just too long or too. It's unreal how much of a um, a kind of, just a head fuck really that like that is so yeah they were fishing big spots back then using a lot more bait and i think fishing it a bit differently whereas now because you're boat dropping 
everyone's like it's, everything's just shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and it's it's almost made it harder and harder and harder yeah. Yeah, i think yeah. like i don't think in some ways i don't think it's ever been more difficult that lake uh you know it's probably busier than ever i think you know the 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 fish are a lot further through the pressure cycle yeah, as definitely. well um and because you can boat drop like you know, every square inch of the lake is fishable and you can present, you know, I mean, I can put my rigs on the bottom on there as well as I could lay them out on this table in front of us. And inevitably that just makes things harder and harder and harder when everyone can do it. And that's That's kind of par for the course. Yeah. Yeah. The variance that you'd have, if that was casting, there'd be loads of people that weren't presented, but if you're You're presented on the, the most perfect little spots, and you still not it's still not happening. You haven't really got a lot of other places you can go, have you? No. Um, other than flipping it and I don't know, starting to fish choddies over a spread mm-hmm. or something like that. But and I've thought about all these things multiple times. You know, it's like <laughs> I was laughing to someone last summer. I was saying it's more like fucking, you know, like the Crystal Maze, <laughs> like Challenge Annika, yeah. trying to get a rod in position on this place sometimes, you know, as opposed to fishing. Like sometimes it just feels like some mad, like technical challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it can be so hard sometimes in a big wind to get a rig on a spot. I was like, it does feel like some weird Crystal Maze challenge. Do you know what I mean? Trying to get something through a hole that big or whatever, like without touching the sides or, um, you know, and, a, a few times I thought to myself, are we just making it really difficult for ourselves? Yeah. Sort of needlessly. But the vast majority of the lake bed just isn't presentable. Savagely um, weedy. Savagely weedy. But but also it's like very little of it is the sort of weed that you would even dream about presenting a choddy over as well because it's so like irregular. Big towers of it, you know, like from me to you, there'll be a height difference of like six or eight foot in the weed. Jeez. Some of it's all folded over. There's big gaps between it. There's like just all sorts, like put a charity over that and lottery. Yeah. Yeah. Massive lottery. And I think most of the time it would just be strong mid water as well. Just, you know, so yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I think the boat dropping is just sort of an inevitability of the fishing on there now. Like I did do a bit of casting in the autumn where I was fishing a bit shorter because okay. the sort of bait and stuff I was using, I was using a few naturals and stuff like that. And the tench are savage in that place. Oh, is that tench as well? Tench are terrible. Um, Biggins? Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like to 12, 13 You're pounds. You're not selling stonies to me here yeah, now, I tell you. That it's sounds hard. It's tough. Yeah, it's tough going. But I like the challenge, you know what I mean? It was the, as well, it was the challenge that excited me. You know, I the, the actual stock, mate. Give me an idea. I know, I know. Obviously, the character fish it's about we'll forty five carp left it's in there now. Forty five, about forty five, but there's probably only twenty of them get caught regularly. The rest yeah. are sort of, you know, maybe a once a year sort of thing. Mm. Um, this spring, for example, was a bit of a mad one. I think um, I reckon I'm guessing here, but we were chatting about it the other day, and I reckon. 80% of the captures this spring were made up by, I reckon, about 30% of the stock, if that makes sense. So yeah. quite a lot of them got caught two, three times this yeah. spring. The rest of them just didn't get caught, um, which in a lake that yeah, you can see what's going on, you can drop rigs, you can hand play some really good lads that have caught big carp from all over the country as well fishing there. And like this year from March, uh, you had... 12 to 18 lads a week from Monday every week. Like, what, what, Why do you think that? Is that just because of the prevalence of weed and naturals and, and the actual, the pressure element? Or, or do you think there's another reason? Because you hear it all the time, don't you? Like there's certain lakes and Stoney's has got that standpoint from the, the quality of the fish, the heritage, the history, the people who fished it. You've referenced a few before and the likes of yourselves that are on there now. But there's some lakes where fish go missing or a certain proportion of the stock doesn't ever get caught mm. and it might be a case that they are more natural feeding they might be overly cautious they might have a certain way of feeding but on stonies what do you think that 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 definitive factor is with regards to why that proportion of the stock doesn't get touched i'm honestly not really sure i mean i think it can only be either that some of them are more predominantly tuned into naturals mm. um or that just some of them are slightly more nervous characters do you see them 
As in, like, the ones that you must see other fish that haven't been caught or that, that don't readily come out. Well, I mean, know. so, uh, for, for example, um, this spring, one called Baby Choco, everyone presumed dead, hadn't been caught, I think, for five years. Um, young Terry Wood caught it this year, 40, I can't remember how big it was, 45s, Wow, maybe. It's a big carp. Obviously, we'll eat a lot of food yeah. and that as well. Um either in really good at getting away with it or predominantly eats naturals one or the other but i think you know because of the nature of the angling pressure there's no two ways about it that we've tuned them into a certain way of doing things and as soon as the spots shrink you become quite limited to what you can do as well like most of the areas you can't put a spread of boilie out there and a, a hinge yeah. because it's you know anna you just get mugged by a tench within an hour as well and if that and, and if that was on a little tiny spot at 140 yards that you've hand placed with the boat, the last thing in the world you want is a is a tench. So sort of the tactics have all got like funneled down, yeah, to quite a precise way of fishing and doing things. And a lot of lads fish in a sort of similarish way, partly to avoid the tench, really, and partly because of the nature of the yeah what you've the got, we've got to fish to. Your yeah. experiences from when you got on there. Talk to me about sort of. The first experiences, because you'd done some boat work before you'd fished abroad. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very, it's, I wouldn't say unique, because there are other venues you can do it on in the UK, but there's not a lot where you can go out in a boat, like you said, spend a lot of time out there, really observe things. No. So how did you find all that with regards to, to the actual fishing just going on there to start with? I mean, just fascinating. Yeah. Just from an angling point of view, like I said, I've done loads of boat fishing, um, loads in Europe, and done a fair bit of like, um, you know, nocturnal stroke boating. <laughs> Yeah, over yeah. the years as well um but that is usually a case of like you know like popping a float up with an isotope on stroking out there as quiet as you can scooping a bit of bait over the side and getting back in sort yeah. of thing it, which is just a totally different way of using a boat isn't it um so it, it's it's just fascinating because of what you can what you can see like seeing what they do to spots you know seeing a spot that one week is just is just silt maybe with a couple of tiny little flecks of white and stuff in it to going back the following week and it being cratered out like three inch, four inches deeper and back to gravel, wow. uh, you know, all like the roots from the weed hanging out the side of the spots and stuff. And like, every, like it's unreal what they do to spots in such a short space of time, but equally so spots that look prime and are going suddenly will just get left and the bait just sits there and rots, no. you know, stuff like that as well that if you were confined to the bank yeah you're only trying to read it through your lead and your rod um but to be honest I, like a, an awful lot of what i saw kind of tallies up to how i'd always envisaged it in my mind's eye through leading around really yeah that's reassuring yeah 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 definitely definitely like i've i've always been really precise anyway spot finding and leading and getting the drops that I want with my fishing rods, like, <clears throat> like painfully meticulous to the point where I do my own heading. Sometimes yeah. like I'll be putting rods out and like, there'll be nothing wrong with the cast, but for whatever reason, it just didn't feel quite right. And I can't put it on my rest and sit behind it for the night unless I'm a hundred percent. Um, yeah, it's quite an irritating yeah. trait to be honest. Um, but you just get a feeling where like, even like how the rig like flies in 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 midair like if 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 it's like skipping around a little bit or spins a bit i'll just feather it straight down and bring it in it's got to fly like straight and true it's got to hit the clip just right it's got to like you can't like thud in or do you know what i mean it's it has to i think they're all the things that heighten the chance of a tangle and in like i think that's where rigs get you know, presented badly yeah. and sit poorly, either hitting the clip plate, hitting it too early, if it spins in fly, all that sort of stuff, I think heightens the chances of you rig sitting badly, massively, personally. Um, you know, so uh, where was I going with that? You were looking at um, looking at spots, observations, basically. So <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So I've always been really precise on that front um, sort of anyway. And I'd always really tried to like, think really carefully about what I was feeling and like trying to visualize the spot in my head, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, I'd always kind of like, I've done, I've done really well over the years on spots where, you know, 
you put your lead out it's like nice clean silt and then you just get like a tiny few little wraps of like not gravel but just like just like really really fine so then back into silt and I'm convinced now, having seen the spots on stone acres, that they're spots that are just starting to get harvested. Because you see it in the silty areas, you'll see like a little bit of shell appear. And then maybe a few days later, you'll see the first few flecks of like a grey gravel where the silt's just coming off the top of the gravel. And then a couple of days later, it'll be back to gravel. And then a week or so later, it might be as big as an unhooking mat if they've really like harvested it at all. Um, You know, and... Yeah, so them little spots that I was finding with the lead, them first few little type, not the big like, brrr, done, not the yeah. big trundle spots. Do you know what I mean? I never wanted to fish on those. Um, just them tiny little, tiny little notches, you know, trying to find them. That's, you know, when I started seeing that sort of stuff from the boat, I was like, I bet all them sort of spots I've fished over the years, I bet that's what they are. Um, you know, and yeah, just seeing how big and blatant the big spots look as well. You look at them from the boat and you're like, yeah, no. No. Like anything bigger than this little table, I'm not, like half that table really for me is about as big as I'd want to be fishing Really? On. Yeah. Half the size of this table, which is probably what? Two, three? Oh, foot two, and a half yeah, square. Yeah, foot and a half, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, about a foot and a half square. Yeah. That's. T- it's also interesting and I think, again, I haven't got this perspective because I've never done it, but knowing what you can hit mm. in reality and this is in ideal conditions, forget crosswinds and whatever yep. else might spring up, yep. what you can hit with a rod mm-hmm. rather than being in a boat dropping. Because like you're saying, it's yeah. been refined down, but yeah. I would have no idea I'd find something. But then if I'm able to get back on it, in reality, like you're saying, it's probably the size of this room. I'm yeah. thinking it's probably the size yeah. of like yeah. one corner. I remember um, I remember little Rob uh, telling me years ago, he was like, you'd see him show at first light every day. You're like, 120, 130, 140 out in the middle. They love a show on Stone Acres as well. Mm. They love it. Like you'll see 30, 40 shows sometimes in the morning. Um, he's like, you know, you'd see a big pod show, a lot of them consistently in the same area as well. So you know they've been hitting the bottom probably and been doing something out there. You know, so he said you'd wait until lunchtime or whatever till everything had died down, boat out there, and you'd see these tiny little spots that they'd hit, and you'd just be like, not a chance in hell I can ever get a rod on that because because they were casting back then. Yeah, so he's like you just have to you just have to ignore it and look for stuff that was castable. Um, not because that's the spots that you really wanted to fish, but they were the spots that you can be presented on. That you know, yeah, just that were fishable. Like I say, it's different now because you can fish anything. A couple of the spots I fished last spring that I caught a couple from, um, they were no bigger than the top of that mag. Like wow you know, 12 inches, like silt, you know, so probably like the spot would be maybe, maybe three foot in total, you know, weed either side, just with then like a tiny little crated bit just to sort of maybe one edge or one corner or whatever, you know, almost only big enough to lay the rig out in. Um, Are you not scared that that's going to close up on you though? Once the rig's down, I suppose you're okay with regards to that. Your line lay. Yeah, and you're looking for a bite the following morning, really, within like 12 hours or something from them sort of spots. Because you're not really baiting. It's not like you're putting a big hit of bait out and, you know, trying to work a spot. And I literally never put out more than half a handful on any spot for the whole of the year last year, really. Because essentially Uh, they're going to be in that... A, because you're trying to avoid the tench. Oh, yeah. And B, because I, I wanted to be on spots that I felt had been fed on that morning and I was hoping they were going to come back to naturally the following morning. That, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, but yeah, going back to the casting thing. So in the autumn, um, like I said, I'd set my stall out because I wanted to do a bit of, a bit of casting in the autumn because I was yeah. use some naturals and stuff and uh, I knew the tench were going to be a nightmare. So I was like, if, if I get a tench just after dark... I don't want that rod out of the game until the following afternoon, which is what happens a lot of the time on there. You know, lads will get a tench just after dark, midnight or whatever. And often they'll just, the rod's propped up until the morning. So often you'll do laps around that lake at first light and there's multiple rods propped up behind people's brollies that just haven't gone back out. Because realistically, you're just not getting them back out there after dark. Um, So I was like, right, I want to set my stall out to cast. So put blocks out. Um, I've got my casting set up on, you know, just, but I just tied sort of like a 
about a foot and a half, I suppose, of um, of mono and a big like 20 mil white pop-up. Right. Just tied it on just to get my clips. So I could go out, check it, go back, tweak the clip, six foot, uh, sorry, six inches or whatever, or foot or whatever, put it back out, row back out, check it again. What were these spots? Were these slightly bigger spots then, the casting spots? No, not, not still really. tiny. Maybe is not quite as big as this couch that I'm sat on. So oh, yeah, it's still small. Four or five foot by a couple of foot wide. Ranges of these? Uh, no, it was just like it was just less like, than 10 wraps. Yeah. Um, but even so, it was still, it took multiple attempts to get the clips right. And that would be like skimming the back of the block you know, a big H block as well. Looks yeah. massive as well, doesn't it? You know, especially at that range. Skim the back of the block. You'd be like, yeah, that's perfect. Swung in, you felt it down. You'd think that'd be perfect. You go out there, the rig would be nowhere in sight. Yeah, it's horrible. It's like out behind the spot. It's too short. So, you know, and that's me being really precise and meticulous as well. Yeah, taught me loads that. Taught me loads. Like when I go back to a normal lake now where I'm casting, mm. I'll be even more meticulous. It's a feel Stop though, finding. isn't it? From yeah, what it's, I've it's, yeah, it's to, feel. You can't like it's all feel. There's not like a tangible, I don't know, like a place you can put the rod. You can do all that, but there's still a speed, a feel at which it hits the clip, a feel at which it, and that, and people get tuned into that, don't they? Completely. In order, in order to to be consistent, it's not like you can. You just got to do it, haven't you? Really? Yeah, it's like a muscle memory thing, yeah. isn't it? You know, yeah. you, you and also everyone's got their own little way of doing it. You know, um, some lads, I've seen quite a bit of footage of, of Daryl casting over the years and he often um, hits his clip with his rod out to the side, mm. like sort of parallel to the bank and goes down like that. Um, you know, everyone's got their own sort of different way of doing things. Um, you know, I always like to try and finish with my rod at exactly the same angle, like yeah. every time. And it's just, I, I do it in a certain way, finish at a certain point. Because that's the thing, if you know, you can hit a clip... But if you finish with your rod there, or you finish with your rod there, you could be six foot difference. Yeah. Which on a smallish spot is the difference between being fishing or just not fishing at all. Yeah, like you yeah. might as well just have left it propped on your body, you know? Um, I mean, not all lakes are that weedy and not all spots are that precise and that small. But I think on a lot of lakes, even casting lakes, I think if you went out in a boat and you could look at what you've put out there, you know, with a spom and go and look at your rigs. Ooh. I think a lot of you'd be horrified. A lot yeah, of the I time. don't want to, mate. No, I mean, that is, the, <laughs> it's like a blessing and curse in equal yeah. measure, I think. Absolute but, torture, yeah. mate. But you look at all the good lads, mm. Miles, Daryl, Danny's, like, unbelievably meticulous with yeah. their spot finding and casting. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, that's the what I, I, I've always thought this, like, everyone does. Th- things in a different way they use different rigs different baits different presentations different things but i feel like that's the one thing that they're all completely consistent across the board with it's like rig placement accuracy spot finding always on point like that runs as a trend between all the best anglers out there i think definitely um your success on there you talked about a mega spring the first spring what how did did it build to that or was it a case of you pretty much timed spring right got in good areas and caught them mate yeah it was just sort of when i look back at it now and i mean i I did say it last year actually i was like i I was under no illusions that i'd been i felt like i'd fished really well and i think i had fished well like you got to fish well to catch them consistently on there Mm -hmm. but i was also really fortunate with timing like no two ways about it. Um, you know, I mean, I, I caught one within 12 hours. Unbelievable. I caught one on my first morning. No way. I caught one of the big ones on my first morning. Yeah. Um, what fish, fish? Fish called the advanced passed away, sadly, um, later, well, last year, later that spring. Um, so it was its last capture. Um, a couple of ounces under 40 pounds. Um, first morning, which was, which was mad. Really. I, there's some really good anglers done, you know, 20, 30, 40 nights before their, before their first one. So it was sort of, you know, I saw a few, I got rigs out in the right area and, and, and I caught one the next morning. And it's, that's carp fishing, isn't it? Sometimes it can be that easy. Um, yeah, that's quality that. This spring, like I was saying to you before, 35 nights down the line and only had one to show for it. 
that but capture, I, what, what, what were you putting out? What, where did you see him? It's just that it was a zig, actually, that was. Was it? Yeah, it was a zig. They do like a zig on there, don't they? Yeah. I only saw two. It was it was early. It was early March. Um, it was still cold. There was no one on the lake whatsoever. It was deserted. Not a single person. I actually checked the app to make sure it wasn't closed for some reason. I was like, what's going on? Going like, on where yeah. is it? Where is everybody? It wasn't a single car on the complex. I was like, this is weird. I was like, what's going on? And um, I actually had that one in the net the following morning. And I still hadn't even spoke to anyone. No one had even walked around. Um, one lad, Will, had turned up the previous evening, set up and just, and just cast. Um, but I hadn't actually spoke to him. He came around just as I was lifting it out. That's but, some intro to the olds at Tick. Yeah, mad. Yeah. It almost happened too quick because I sort of didn't really have chance to like, you know, to sort of build my anticipation yeah. for it. Do you know what I mean? It was like first, first morning, literally first morning. I think I drank like one coffee, single bleep, out of the clip. Um, I was like, fuck me, it's away. This is easy, right. mate. Um, the depth of water, the length of zig, what did you go for? It's like classic three, three quarter. Right. Yeah. Saw a couple show. It was a big wind like 35, 40 mile an hour wind, whacked the float out, popped the float up. And um, I'd done a little bit of, uh, of like dropping zigs from the boat before. Had you? Yeah, only a couple of times. But I just looked at it and I was like, I'm just going to drop it with the boat because then I know it will be yeah. 100%. Like I say, it was a big wind and it was like, it was a sort of crosswind, but from behind me. And I was like, mm, I was like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to boat it out. Yeah, so bowed it out, just laid it out. It was so windy, though, I couldn't sort of, I, I, I didn't scope it, I didn't check it or anything right. like that, do you know what I mean? I just, like, um, float had popped up in weed, so and it was over the weed, which was what I wanted as well. Not really a fan of fishing the zigs over clean, clear yeah. bottom, much prefer fishing them over weed, so I was happy it like, landed soft, got my depth, three quarters, just bowed it out there, dropped it following morning. It was, it was away. Um, yeah, and I just, yeah, sort of like say the spring just rolled on really nicely, but it was a lot quieter last spring. Like you could see them and get on them. That was the difference. Um, and because they love a show on that place as well. Like if you're on your toes and you angle like that, which I always have mm. Northwest thing still ingrained in me, like you get up at first light every day and you look, do you know what I mean? And if they're showing somewhere else, you pack up and you move you as move, quick as you yeah. can. It's, you know, little Rob taught me that to be fair back in the 90s he's mad um you know uh sort of so yeah the, just like I say the spring was the spring was great and then um i had had a couple lost a couple and then i tripped to france with elmo end of april it was and i remember thinking at the time i was like i kind of didn't really want to go everything was happening on stone easy i was like i'd, I'd got into it i was yeah. i was kind of like oh i kind of really want to be here um but yeah i was off to France. Uh, we we're filming it as well for SIP. And, yeah, yeah um, I remember seeing it. Yeah. I was excited to go away. It was sort of Elmo's first trip to um, some of them sort of big French waters and stuff as well. I've done a bit in Belgium with him before, but it's first trip to France and that. And um, yeah, we had a mega trip, like at a 50 pounder, I think six or seven 40 pounders. Yeah. Fished a couple of different places. I think we had about 40 fish or something. And so it was great. Like we t- timing was bang on as well. Got like, like caught loads of lovey carp, made a nice film. Pretty much nothing happened on Sony's while I was away as well, which is sweet. Touch, and then yeah. um, literally got back. And as I got back, it just started to kick off. Like a few messages came through and uh, it there was a mad spell where it did, it did a load of fish in a space of about 10 days, basically. And obviously, because I'd just come back from the best part of two weeks in France, I had a load of work to do. Obviously, Ben, like, you know, I wasn't just going to load my kit and go straight to Oxford. So I um, had a week at home. Text kept pinging through. Another one's been out. Another one's been out. Another one's been out. I was like, oh, I've Must missed it. it. Yeah. I was like, I've missed it. Like, this was it. This was the spring spell. Um, and got down there. I think there was like 17 lads on. Wow. There was only a couple of swims free. Unbelievably, saw a load that morning in front of the area that was still free. There was this like one wedge of water, basically um, down one end, down the bottom end that was still free. Yeah. Managed to get in, um, in amongst them. Uh, found two mega spots exactly where they showed that morning. I just watched them all morning, waited till it had finished, went out in the boat. Took me ages to find them as well. Just small spots. Couldn't find anything that I was happy with. A couple of old spots. 
right. just like old gravel that you could still see had like a little furry layer on top. You can see that they've not been touched spots easily. Like you can tell when a spot's been f- like fed on fresh and when it's, yeah, when it's done, when it's old. Yeah. 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 Um, they'd obviously, you know, from the previous year, but they'd left it well alone. Yeah. Do you find that again, most yeah. of the spots, once they've done a, they're done, they're done, they're not yeah, revisited. Yeah. Once they're done, they often just get, you, you get, I think you get a limited time span on a lot of spots. Right. Definitely. Um, you don't see them being regenerated a year after or anything. Yeah. Yeah. You sometimes, okay. sometimes, um, Personally, I don't think they're the good spots. I like to, if I can, I like to try and find the fresh, natural ones that are just that because they want to feed on them, not because it's an old spot that gets a regular bit of bait. I think they're much harder to catch off them than they are off the little natural spots that are getting freshly turned. Because also, primarily by the sounds of it, they are natural feeders looking for that rather than looking for bait. Like if yeah. you're putting in, if you're saying there you did a spell where you were putting in a handful of bait or you're mm. fishing zigs, they're not exactly getting massive bigots of... No, they're not. I, I mean, obviously they have in the past. Yeah. People have done that and it does work on there, definitely. But like I say, it's just the logistics of it these days and with the tension stuff. Yeah. And the it's, yeah, the baiting can be a difficult one to get to work. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, so uh, see all these shows waited until the afternoon till it had all died down gone out there i remember i was out there for about a couple of hours i thought i'd almost lost faith that i was going to find anything i was a bit gutted actually because i was like i knew what i wanted to find mm. and I, I just hadn't found it and i was like right on the outskirts of what is my water when you're out there in the middle like 140 150 yards in the boat it's because obviously effectively the water from each swim backs onto each other of course so you never want to take the piss and be too, but it's a fine line. You, you know, you want to explore yeah. sometimes like the outside edges of the water that you've got available to you, but equally so you don't want to be boating around in someone else's water either. So, um, and it was the first night that I'd put rods on the deck on there as well. Right. I'd done, I think three or four trips on the zigs previous to that, but I still hadn't put a rod on the deck. Um, so it was, it was my first night with rods on the bottom. Anyway, found this little spot. I remember think as soon as I saw it, I was like, that's it straight away. I knew it. I was like, that's the spot dropped a block. I was like, <laughs> thank God. I was like, thank God. And then saw another one, uh, six or eight foot away, almost straight away. I was like, amazing. Dropped two blocks, gone back to the bank, run round to where I'd been watching them from. And it was plumb on where they'd been showing really? that morning. I'd seen like 35 shows that morning on that area. So I was like, five shows. I was like, I was like, that is the spot, 100%. That's the spot. Put two rods out, two little tigers, tiny pinch on each. And they both went the following morning. Um, yeah, they both went the following morning. One with one called Patch Common, just over 30. And the first one was um, the big common that they call coins, which is super rare. And I think still it's got less than half a dozen captures to its name ever or something madly or certainly in recent history in the last 10, 12 years or whatever. That's um, epic. But what's the fight like in there with regards, you've got loads of weed. Is it just straight out in the boat or what? Straight out in the boat. There's a yeah. huge bed of milfoil in front of there, that swim. And I already had a plan in my head. I was like, forget a bite, hit into it, life jacket on, straight in the boat. And straight, I was like, I'm not, there's no way I'm trying to crank that in from 150 yards through all that. Hop straight in the boat. It was a mega morning as well. It was in- unbelievably atmospheric. It was like this soft, like golden sort of orangey yellow likes. It was still early. Yeah. I had a couple of liners as well. I remember thinking like, I was like, fucking hell. I think they're, I think they're back out there. Cause what happens often is you'll see them in one spot one morning. You go out in the boat, do your stuff. You just bounce them off. And they're just somewhere else the following morning. Okay. That happens all the time. It's like ping pong. Unfortunately, you just shift them around. I think what I had in my favor looking back now is that's not an area that they spend the daytimes in. Go out there, feed in the mornings and they drift Move down off. and they end up down in like the green boat and sort of plateau corner for the days. So all the time I was out there in the boat doing my stuff, yeah. they were probably a few hundred yards away. They've gone back out to the middle to feed in the morning. Um, so yeah, I got straight in the boat. Uh, yeah, just kind of clicked the motor on to like not full bore, but like, you know, three or whatever under the elbow, just like wound out to it. 
and um, got out to within sort of 10, 15 yards of it, like clicked the motor off, wound into it properly. Mm. And it's just, it was just plugged in a little bit of weed. It's tap clear. I didn't, I, I didn't even have any glasses on, but I could just, I could see it. It's just unplugged and just come over. And I just remember seeing it, it was like 45 pound common. So it was like, I remember seeing it and thinking, shit, yeah, that's massive. And it's just turned basically and rolled. And I was like, I can scoop him. <laughs> He's no. just like, yeah, literally, mate, it was over within seconds. Literally just, he just rolled right in himself and he was just wallowing. I just scooped him. Just everything happened to be, yeah. And it was a really light hook hold as well. It was only like, it was only just in the edge, mate. Like a long fight and that would have dropped out. Definitely. But they would be epic battles, mate, from a bow at first. Yeah, like, mega. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, the second was. So, so got back to the bank anyway, like um, dropped it in a retainer for a little bit. Thankfully, Dan Wildboar and um, some of the lads were down filming with Scott. So right. they had the proper cameras and that. So we got some mega footage and like that that was all great. But I still had my warm rod out there fishing because I'd not wiped it out in the fight. He was still out there fishing. I'd kind of forgotten about it. And I remember while we were doing the pictures, I had like a couple of little flurries of bleeps. And I remember Tom Gibson was actually straddled over the top of my rod at the time, like that with his legs. I remember him looking at his feet and he's sort of, at it. and like we were just laughing about it. In hindsight, there were liners. It wasn't Tom. They were liners. And uh, literally the lads have only just dispersed. I'm still piss wet through. And it's that, that one's melted off. Um, straight back out in the boat. That one was a bit more of a proper boat battle out in the yeah. middle. Told me about for a bit. And, um, yeah, mega brace. But that was my first morning with, with rods on the deck. Um, you got 12 foot rods as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did have my 12, six, well, 12 sixes actually. Yeah, I had my hands. Like yeah. right. I did, well, not ideal. I don't like using 12 footers in the boat at all. Um, for the rest of the summer, I did use a little 10 footers. Yeah. Much better from a boat. Always a little short net as well. Nothing worse than a big net and a, and a big rod. I've done a few in the horrendous, boat. like, I've got tiny arms, mate, like T-Rex <laughs> arms. It's a nightmare if you've got a long rod in a boat, mate. I'm a gonna <laughs> got net the thing. It's an yeah. absolute killer, but um, that's epic. But yeah, yeah, it was, like I say, it was a hell of a morning. And then my next trip down, again as well, like the timing couldn't possibly have been any better. It was a fresh northeasterly due about 36 hours after I was due to get down. And it was just getting to the point, sort of like late May, where they'd not really got in the sort of this calf bay corner yet really much that year. But historically they always loved it in there in the couple of weeks and the run up to spawning and on the first warm Northwest, uh, sort of Northeasterly, sorry. And what have you. And the forecast had, sh- I'd been watching the forecast and I was like, God, that's shaping up. I was like, I know where they're going to be. And, um, got down there. The lake was really busy again, barely any free swims, everyone locked in doing their four nights, doing their weeks, like all that sort of thing. And, it just so happened the lad called Jake, bless him, like he was the same lad that I'd moved in after the week before as well. What he, caught those two? Yeah, he was leaving again that morning. Um, they weren't really there at that point. Right. He'd seen like one or two. He was just a couple of days early. And uh, yeah, he was going. And I was like, I remember saying to him, I was like, oh, who's, you know, who's, who, who's moving in here? And he was like, oh, no one's bucketed it, mate. I was like, you're joking. <laughs> Like so sweet, Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Do, like yeah, couldn't couldn't believe it really. Um, and I'd f- had four that trip. Um, four, you had four. How long was your session? Three nights. Yeah, that's some going on the deck yeah. again, or is it? Yeah, yeah, you're on the deck. Yeah, on the deck. Yeah, same tactic. Still, just is that a luxury? That, I suppose it is. Maybe a luxury that you've got with regards to on there with sort of life in general. Could you at the time pick around weather systems and when you saw weather coming in, you weren't fixed to certain days. You had that freedom and flexibility to maybe get on there when when change was apparent or not? Not really. Okay. I mean, I, like theoretically, I, I, could, I could fish at the moment. I could, unless I've, you know, I've got other commitments and stuff, which I often do end up with. But, you know, theoretically, I could work my fishing around whatever day of the week I wanted. But I've always tried... Um, or at least for the last sort of 12 months or so um, to just to try and stay fairly regimented yeah. with things um, and just fish a couple of nights, like from Monday, Monday, Tuesday night, or sometimes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, really. Um, and then that gives me a couple of days to work, two, three days towards the end of the week. Mm. Um And ideally spend a day or two with the missus yeah. at the weekend. Check in with the missus. Yeah. yeah. Nice it's funny as well. Like, 
as soon as you fall out of a routine and a rhythm for me personally at least anyway everything just starts to dissolve a little bit and it just kicks kicks work out or it kicks other commitments out and you know so yeah i just try and just do my nights like that fairly fairly consistent so it was just it was just good timing really i'll tell you what i'm interested in and you think we referenced it earlier with regards to zigging when you go out in a boat and drop a zig what is it visual? Can you see that from far away? You can see like? them a mile off. They look unbelievably obvious. Can you? They look unbelievably obvious. What, like even a bun- even above a load of weed? You think I just just, just like even a black one? No, just looks so obvious, mate. Painfully obvious. Because I always think you can always... see them without glasses. You can just like if it if it's calm, just lower it down. You can just you're like, oh. Do you get much movement in them? Or um, not? Not that I've seen. Right. Um, like I have been out a couple of times before now when it, like I did it a couple of times this spring when it was like 30, 35 mile an hour. Okay. Um, and I'd been out and dropped a block. So it's what I was trying to do or what I try and do where I can is just if I'm dropping zigs from the boat, I try and do it as like quickly and discreetly as possible. So I don't faff around with blocks and all that sort of stuff. Just literally pair of glasses, just visual, you know, just looking for a big weed bed looking for a bar, looking for a feature, looking for something basically to slot it up against. Um, Because on Stonies, you've got, they've got fairly distinct routes that they take. You've got a couple of great big gravel bars, basically that run down the middle and they definitely hug those. Um, There's a couple of other features and bits and stuff that, that, do you know what I mean? That, that they use routes. Yeah. So, you know, you'd have a big, big gravel bar, like four or five foot wide, maybe that's maybe six foot of water on top of it, mm. but then it will drop down into like eights, tens, twelves, maybe something. Like that. So you're all kind of slotting the zig just off the side of it, above the weed. So it's just sat off the side uh, of the yeah, bar, yeah. that sort of scenario. But you can do that visually just by eye quite, quite easily. Um, but when it's windy, really windy, it's, that's really difficult. Yeah. Uh, so what I started doing was going out uh, with my scope and blocks find the spot, block it, drop a H block yeah. and then drop to the block. Right. Uh, so I drop all four because you can use four rods on stonies as well. So you've done all four to your blocks and then each one, just one trip. And then I'd go back out with my scope, um, scope it, check it and then lift the block in. Jeez, that is painstaking, isn't it? Yeah. That's just putting zigs out. It's hard to think, yeah, of all things you could easily flop out. You think that's what's so mad on there sometimes is like, you know, if you imagine you've got 16 lads doing four rods, um, and you've got an unbelievable caliber, caliber of angle on there as well, isn't you? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a lot of really like solid, everyone's a solid angle, yeah, yeah, exactly, and some really good angles as well. Um, yeah, so the boat kind of usage can be quite interesting and it's a bit of a game of chess that sometimes as well you know lads kind of thinking okay well you know all the lads on that bank have all redone their rods today i'm just going to leave mine so it's a bit of a game of cat and mouse sometimes yeah between what lads are doing or if like the lads either side of you are going to go and redo theirs sometimes you'll sort of think well i might as well just go and redo mine yeah. because there's going to be loads of boat activity either side of me i might as well just go and redo mine um but also I know for a fact that a lot of the zigs weren't fishing this spring. They were just wow. getting mowed down by the algae and the tow. Um, yeah. Someone went out to check theirs after a couple of hours and it was only a couple of foot off the deck. Oh, you're joking. What? Just no. clung to it and just sunk it. It's like oh, green rope. Oh no. Yeah. So stuff like that as well that you just wouldn't, you wind them in, they look perfect. Well, you, you don't see that. Gone oh. by the time you wind in. Yeah, it's gone. That is a proper head mess, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. So unless you're rechucking every few hours, but they definitely don't like being cast at either. So, do you know, what do you do? What do you do? What a puzzle. Well, sort of, yeah. I mean, it only became apparent towards the end of this year, like this this spring, like towards the end of April, that that was happening. And I was looking at it and I was thinking... Do you know what? A lot of the ones that have been caught this year have been caught within a couple of hours of rods going out. Right. Um, either like fresh rechucks in the morning or something's happened and someone's had to redo them and they've had, and you know, I like 
looked at all the captures and I was like, that, that is a definite trend. And then, like I say, I spoke to this lad that had been back out, checked it, and his was... Um, because often you don't go back out and check them in the morning. No. Very often. Because you will just wind them in and then go out and replace them. Yeah. If you're doing that. Or if you're just winding in to go home, the last thing you're going to go and do is get in your boat and go and have a boat around because someone's moving in after yeah, you. So of it's, course. you know. So, yeah, it definitely made me think. I started using bigger bits of foam. More buoyant. More buoyant. Like just slightly chunkier, fatter bits of foam. And just doing them as close to dark as I could, ready for first light. Um, but yeah, mm. difficult. But it's, it's interesting. It's all that kind of stuff that keeps it. I quite like it. Keeps it interesting. That is interesting. You know? Zigs are always like, I know that they've done well on there, but also being able to see them and have a perspective from a boat and mm. on a big pit where you do get weather systems come in. And but just to I, see but honestly, like, like a bit of red, it just looks. You're joking. Oh, it looks so blatant, mate. You spot it a mile off. You spot oh, it a mile off. I think that. Because there's just, A, because there's nothing around it in the column. Yeah. And B, because, you know, weed generally looks fairly dark when you're looking at it from above, like everything that looks quite, but even just like, like unless you're using something to, to like to black your hooks down as well, you can see the hooks from the boat. No. Easy. Yeah, that's a horrible, yeah. I don't know. If, yeah. I mean, you know, whether or not it, it, it makes bothers the car yeah. or makes any difference or not. I, I don't know, but you know, they're definitely, I think, you know, when you've got a zig in your hand and you're looking at it and you're looking at a big wind swept pit in front of you, you think, fucking hell, how's that ever going to catch me a car exactly. whacking it out there? Exactly. But actually they look really blatant. You know, I, I'm like these days sort of, especially on stonies where you've, you've boat dropped them. If they turn up on you in the morning and they're showing. I'm more sitting there thinking, how have I not caught one? Right. They're so obvious. How has one of them not gone? Especially if you've got four out there and there's a, you know what I mean? And they were just wallowing out in amongst them. You're like, how has that not gone? How has that not gone? And there was some mad spells this spring. Like I think the fish behaved quite oddly because of how busy it was. So there was a few spells, particularly around the moons where it was really busy. Yeah. Where there was like, just literally they were just showing for fun 20 30 40 50 60 shows like a day but just not getting caught in pretty tight areas as well and lads fishing really well right in amongst them and you're like they are literally jumping in and around those hook baits you're like how are, how are they not falling for no, that would kill you wouldn't it yeah interesting but then they what happened this year was the, the the weeks on the moon were really busy. Yeah. The weeks after the moon were a bit quieter. The fish seemed to spread out a little bit and started getting caught. That was sort of roughly the pattern for the spring. But yeah. That first year, that first spring and that first season in general, I mean, you've not only hit the ground running, you've had four in a session, you've had a couple of, well, you've had a big and first thing. It's, it's all pretty much going absolutely rosy throughout the course mm. of the rest of the season. What what was that like? How much did you fish it through the course of the summer, I, autumn, I didn't really do a lot in, in the summer at all. Like typically of me, I, I just, I fish quite hard and intense little spells and then I just lose momentum because I'm like, oh fuck, I've got so much to catch up on. Like I can't yeah. keep like, you know, even just to, I say even, you know, three nights a week, I think is a lot of fishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, I mean, a lot of lads do like three or four nights a week, you know, on Stonies and on Dinton and the likes of them sort of lakes, you know, I think that's sort of not, you know, uh, not unusual, should we say. But like, yeah, you know, for me to do three nights, I did like a couple of little spells this spring where I was trying to do three nights a week, but it's, you know, it's a 2 a.m. start Monday morning. So you fish Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night get home Thursday afternoon, like shot to bits mm. and pretty much useless in terms of doing any work. Try and squeeze like as much work as humanly possible into Friday. And then, you know, a bit of Saturday, spend, you know, Saturday, Sunday morning with the missus. And then you're getting ready to go again. I was like, I can't, I, was yeah. like, I can't keep this up. You know, so only did that for like a, tight, a little, little spell, like literally just a few weeks. And then sort of just started doing a couple of nights every other week. And, 
what have you. But um, yeah, you know, it's uh, I can't remember where I was going with that. But the rest of the sort of summer, into yeah, last autumn. year. So yeah, yeah. so I kind of like i had done the same. i had done a couple of weeks on the bounce and fished quite hard. Mm bunch of commitments this that and the other and i was like i really need to catch up on work and some other stuff and what have you so didn't really fish much at all in the summer and he did a couple of trips um did manage to catch one more um in the couple of trips i did in the summer and then i didn't start again until the last week of september it was what, so what, what was the was there any significant change throughout the course of that period going from spring through to autumn what were you what were you finding when you went back out in the autumn and sort of had a it was a different like was it it's a completely different lake yeah um a there was no viz so all the viz had gone and whereas them first few trips in the spring it's tap clear you're boating around you can see everything go back in the summer and you you can't see anything uh so you can only donk around but you know knowing how few and far between those good spots were and how small they are just feels futile almost yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what i mean and so often you can drop a block lead down, you'd be like, dunk, dunk. You'd be like, oh, that feels great. Drop um, like a rig down there with a bare hook or uh, like a little grappling lead. Mm, it's chocker. Solid, yeah. It just drops down through the Canadian. It feels, you know, like so hard to find and pinpoint small spots. Jeez, so difficult. How do you um, do it? You just have to. Well, what, what a lot of the lads do is get everything dialed in. Uh, like with a GPS okay. in in the spring, yeah, all the spots dialed in. I mean, I've got like I think I've got about 120 spots on there now um, in my in my GPS. Like, even if I'm just boating out to go and drop another rod somewhere else, and I see something, I'll just quick pin. pin yeah. It's just there for the future. Um, and if you're struggling or you see a few shows in an area, you think oh, I've got a couple of pins in that sort of area. Head out, have a little explore, and at least you then got something to go on. You got a little starting point. Um, Otherwise, blind, it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. But again, thankfully, I managed to hit the ground running in, in that like, late autumn when I got back. Um, found a few, unbelievably, off the back of little Rob's experiences from t- like 15 years previous. No way. Yeah. I remember- you still speak to him a fair bit, don't you? Yeah, like um, not as much in the last few years, but yeah. still keep in touch. Since I've been fishing stonies as well, I've sort of, I haven't like... Uh, you know, I think grill him for info oh, yeah. and all that sort of thing. But I'd sort of, um, yeah, kept in touch, a few messages and stuff now and again. But but when I lived up north, I used to go around regularly, um, yeah. you know, probably on a weekly basis or like every couple of weeks, um, looking through pictures, chatting about stuff, this, that and the other. And I remember he'd had a couple of good runs in the autumn from this one particular area, just in really short. And for some reason, the way he described it, like just really stuck in my consciousness. I don't know why. Just something about it was really appealing. Right. The autumn, the setting, the spots, where they were, the fact they only showed after dark, all this, it just stuck in my consciousness, just something about it. And um, so when I went back in September, um, got there at 1am that trip and um, just walked around in the dark. And that was pretty much the first place that I went and I went and sat and listened. And they gave themselves away. I had half a dozen in that same area, really short, found some spots and unbelievably caught four. Caught Again, four. that trip, which really on Stonehenge, like to put it into context, four is a, is a season's, is a season's gonna, result. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like for a lot of lads, it, it's more than a season's result. So I was like, like I say, I was under no illusions how lucky I'd been really. A couple well, of those, couple they, of those times. Again, single sort of small spots, fishing tiny little traps on the deck. Tiny little traps, yeah. What sort of rig? What were we, what were we going for here? What what were you using? Switched to using lead clips the last few years. Um, right. e- even before Stoney's, when I was fishing on um on my little no publicity, uh, Con Valley Syndicate, yeah. um, switched to fishing clips on there, just because I always find if you're fishing helis, you have to be even more careful hitting the clip and watching it fly. Okay. You think there's more variance in if you use I just a think there's way more chance of a heli tangling. Right. Just be, by nature, because it flies back completely parallel to the lead core. Right. Do you know what I mean? They, they literally fly like that, don't they? All, yeah, yeah. all sort of. Whereas with a lead clip, with an anti tangle sleeve, you've got a bit of separation. Yeah, you've got a good bit of separation. Especially using, I, I like a really tiny little hook bait 
often. Yeah. I'm using like a, a tiger as big as my little fingernail sort of thing. You can just get a drill into. You can just get the small bit of cork into, basically. I love a small tiger as a hook bait. Um, yeah, no Kilgore. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say giant nuts. Dirty, great, big dog. Yeah, he sent me a picture the other day. I was chatting about the tench and stuff. And um, on Stoney, he's just like, mate, put one of these out. And he sent me the picture of this rig and like, you know, with his tubing Ridiculous. and the two tigers and everything else, I reckon the whole thing must have been about that long. It's longer than a rig. Isn't yeah, it? it was like as long as most of my rig. Like, um, he, yeah, he does. But it works thing. for him, and it, you know, and I got to be honest. To be fair, some of them sort of rigs and in, in those sort of situations are definitely king because they do avoid the tension. They do just pick out the big ones and. You caught what did, have you? Did you, but, get, did you have any trouble with the tents just fishing little traps like that and little tigers? Yeah, right? but not many. Okay, not many. I caught a couple in the autumn, but I was using caster and a bit of chopped worm and yeah, what have you. So, but again, not much. Just literally like, um, like one scoop. Yeah, or just less than one scoop. Um, per spot per night. It's interesting because I remember speaking to uh, to Gary in one of the early podcasts we did and he talked about bream. I think he was talking about bream and he, I know he loves fishing for him, but he was saying if you do use something small, you can often avoid them because of the greediest fish. So if there's something big and blatant, they love it unless it's really big and they can't physically put it in the mouth. Some it's small, but if you've had a few tench on there as well, I suppose they're in numbers. They'll be there if they're there and take it anyway, won't they? they yeah. The beast. Yeah. And I, I'm sort of, I've always been, I've always been quite a big believer in using what I think is the most efficient thing I possibly can. Right. As opposed to using something that's going to try and keep stuff at bay. I'd like, and especially on stonies where they are pretty riggy because of the way they get fished for. Yeah. That's pretty intense. I, yeah. But then again, like, um, I, I, I know a lad, he's, he's another one of the sort of Colm Valley lads, um, mega angler, caught loads of good ones. He's turned up this spring and he's, he's had a few and he's using, something a bit different on that front. I don't know exactly what to be fair, but mm. I can, I, I've got an idea, but I find it hard to put them sort of rigs out, yeah, especially yeah, when you're yeah. watching it lay down on the deck and even just a lead clip system and stuff. Sometimes you drop it down there and you're like, it all just looks a bit obvious. Yeah. Um, but I think more than anything with the tench, as soon as you started putting more bait in, they catch came. the tench. Yeah. Okay. If you were using half a dozen tigers and a, pinch of chops you'd get away with it which is fine if you're putting it on a spot that the carp are going to come back to naturally yeah because then they're not going there for your bait like you're not training them in to come back to your bait yeah you're putting it something out there that's as close as you can to a natural food basically you know crushed tiger is about as close to crushed snail as really you're going to get isn't it without putting crushed snail out there um and you're hoping that they're going to make a mistake because they come back to feed naturally. Dropping it in, actually lowering it in. Obviously, you talked about tiny spots. Are you back winding them down onto the spot? Are you hand placing them? Hand, hand placing with the scope. Wow. So, like rod to the right hand side of me. Yeah. Um, so I, what I always do, I look like depending on which direction the wind is going, I'll place my block, um, sort of on a certain part of the spot, basically dependent, so that you're not. Um, drifting towards your block when you're okay. trying to place, basically, so that you're always ideally sort of drifting a- away from it. Because sometimes be a little bit tricky, but yeah, get the block in. Um, always bait first. Oh right. So I always bait first. A um, couple of reasons, partly because you sort of it can actually be really tricky to get yeah. sort of light, yeah. delicate chopped bits through twelve foot of water onto the exact bit. So I'll literally drop like the tiniest pinch and one single nut, as in like three or four bits of chop and, and like, watch. and a tiger and, and, and watch it. But in big wind, that's a nightmare because like you, you're like, and you're pat and you're with the scope trying to keep an eye on it and, you, and it goes so slow. Like you're almost like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You've done like 10 strokes with the oars by the time it's got to the bottom and you'd be like, sweet. Some lads use the little bait droppers. Yeah. I was going to say a bait dropper. Yeah. I just don't like them because you get a clump on the bottom, mm. and I like a like a really light peppering that's a bit of a spread because I don't want them just sat on one spot. We've all seen the underwater footage now of how yeah. hard they are to catch yeah. when that cool. it's. So, and you've already got that, as so a I spot, just want yeah. like a really light dusting that's like evenly. So like you know, one tiger here, one tiger there, one tiger there, one t- like 
six, eight inches maybe between them all yeah. or something like that. That sounds ridiculously precise, but when you're looking at it from a boat in tap clear water, you sort of can't not be precise if that makes sense because it's like, it's there, it's clear. It's like, yeah, you know, the the the, the possibility to make a conscious decision about how you're going to do it is that you could just wedge a load of bait over the side and just dump a rig in the middle of it. But like, I mean, who would do that in clear water, really, when you can actually see? You know, you're just not going to do that, no, are you? No. Um, so, yeah, always bait first because then I can place the rig on the, like, to make sure that my leader and stuff is, isn't is running through any bait. Right, okay, I see. Whereas if you drop your rig first and then bait after, you're gonna. there's every chance that a yeah. bit of bite, uh, a bit of bait, sorry, might end up over your leader and stuff. I just try and avoid that if I can. Um, yeah, so... It, like I'll I'll put the line basically tight off my tip with the lead hanging down just under the scope. Like basically but like or back, just one or or back to the to the block. Like just sort of check the drift, just check how quick everything, like how quick I'm moving, just make sure I'm keep, like getting the boat steady in the right line, check in, what have you. And then open the bail arm basically and then couple of big scoops yeah head over the sides quickly as you can try and lower it down ideally in one if you can and then drop like scope up and back out into the boat make sure your line lays sweet straight and back up if you need to to make sure your line is going back yeah over the weed in the right direction or like whatever it's it's a drama. It's a drama. It's a proper drama. Yeah. It is when you're trying to get a rig on, uh, you know, like I say, something half the size of a mat or whatever. It is if you, you couldn't all- lower it off the tip, just back winding just down onto them spots. They're just too small. You just wouldn't get them on. Or like if you'd, if you'd put a block on a spot that small and you were trying to lower down to the side of a, a block, again, you'd just be too tight to the cord or whatever in that sort of depth of water. But you tried... Have you tried experimenting with regards to not just fishing it in that? I know we referenced it earlier in the pod, but not just fishing it in that way on those small spots. Have you tried putting some in like low line weed? Have you tried any of that? Now, do you know what? Like, I, because, like last year went so well. Yeah, you smashed it, didn't you? Like, uh, I just caught consistently. Yeah. I caught a couple more through the autumn and stuff as well. And like, what did you catch? You caught the was it the bus? That was the bus you had. I caught the, bu- I caught the bus twice last year. Oh, actually, yeah. I didn't photograph it the second time. That was the last one I caught. Last autumn in October. That's a mega um, fish, mate, isn't it? It was incredible. Yeah, yeah. I was disappointed to catch it again um, just because it was sort of like, it was like it was on the peak of the moon in the autumn. You know, there was a couple of the other big ones on the cards and it kind of like, it was just, I was like, ah, oh, it's the wrong one. You can't pick And like it. one of the other lads, um, Scotty P that was down there who actually turned up in the swim as he'd seen me out in the boat playing it. So he'd wandered round. He was in my swim by the time I got back. He's like, what you got, geese? And uh, I was like, I don't know, man. I was like, it's a big, long, scaly one. And um, I thought um, it was either Adslin or one called Drop Scale, which is um, which is quite a rare one. It should be about 40 pound, 41, 42 pound or something. But because there, there was so much weed in there, I'd not seen it properly. Mm. Never really occurred to me that it might have been the boss again. And um, started pulling the weed out. And yeah, see, it was that. And that's the one that Scott really, want, you know, really wants as well. So... To just unhook it and just slip her back just felt like a bit of a shame. But um, though, isn't it? it is, you can't pick them out in the pond. It's just just one of them. But um, yeah, so I had I had 15 last year. Jeez. I had 15 and lost four. But I don't know. I didn't 15 like... and lost four in a stock of 45 carp, did you say? Yeah, so I mean, it's hooked 20s. And you fished two concentrated periods of spring and autumn, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's some so, going, mate. It just went, it just went well. It just went well. So like, you know, the whole kind of, you know, rig thing, presentation, the sort of spots I was fishing, this, that, and the other, like, just didn't see the need to change it. Yeah, because it was, because it was just working. Like, I honestly felt, I was like, all I've got to do is find them. And I think I've got a really good chance of a bite next morning. That was, that was how I felt. And to be fair, that's how I'd still feel now if I went back there tomorrow. Um... But this season or this spring was very different, mate. Very different, but just couldn't get near them. Like I say, the one morning where I was genuinely on them in a swim that I really wanted to be in and I had rods and traps set, I caught one that morning. 
Um, but that was it. It was really the only morning that was on them. There was like two other mornings where they turned up sort of in my water on, on, on the last morning. Um, and actually one morning when I sat up on them, but each of them, it was sort of like, you know, they turned up not actually where I had my rod set. They right. turned up somewhere else in the swim, like hundred yards away, 150 yards away from where I had my rigs. So I just put a couple of zigs at them for the morning sort of thing, a couple of hours. And then I was off home. So they were only like half chances really. Um, yeah. And one morning where I turned up, um, down in a swim called grassy, they were there that first morning, put a couple of zigs out into him. Perfect. Like just one cast in sweet. I was like really good chance. And they just never turned back up the following day, but they got a bit of habit in that area. They only really spend like 12 hours there, 24 hours. It was right. like big fresh wind. They push in. And then they do the off. And then they, and then they're gone. But, um, why, why the change in terms of not being able to get on them? Did, did it get any busier? It was there a change in, in dynamic? Obviously over the course of time, it's always had publicity, but we talked about it off camera. There was a bit of a wane with regards to the publicity on the place. Sort of what late sort of even pandemic times. It was a bit sort of, there wasn't that much people knew that it was there, but it wasn't outwardly broadcast in video form or anything like that. And then there was some publicity with regards to obviously the stuff you've done with SIP subsequently, but also other people's work. Do you think that had impacted sort of this spring with regards to the, the amount of traffic on there? It's hard to tell, but I, you know, possibly I think, um, you know, 50 pounders turn heads, don't they? (laughs) Especially old Oxford ones that are really, really nice fish. And, you know, I think them two, the two big ones hadn't necessarily been like, been that big and sort of year round and stuff as well, you know? Um, and I think when it lost like bite mark and choco and that, yeah, they were the two, weren't they? Yeah, it sort of it had like peaked in its, you know, in the exposure it was getting and all the rest, and you know there was a lot of lads fishing, and then them two died, and it just, which you often see with mm. lakes, it just sort of died away. I think the pressure, the pressure dropped a little bit. Um, you know, the media sort of coverage dropped a bit. Lads drifted away. Had a good four, five, six sort of quiet-ish years, I think. It's always been a busy lake, but it was it definitely dropped a bit, and then um, obviously them two getting big again, yeah. I think has had a had an impact on that definitely. Um, but how, how do you feel about that then, mate? Because obviously the, this the spring could probably couldn't be two more contrasting springs—an incredible sort of spring, an incredible subsequent season as well in the autumn. This spring, hard one bite, busy, not able to get on them. As an angler who wants to fish that type of venue, who wants to catch those type of carp, where's the trade-off between, and you said it before about it being possible and it not being possible and saying, look, I can't do this because I simply can't angle for the fish when they're there. It's a really tough one. Like, um, in all honesty, like I genuinely didn't think that I was really going to go back to that sort of fishing anyway. Uh And it was only really because I had a bit more time at my disposal last year. I just sort of thought, if I'm going to do this, let's get stuck in. Let's have a proper go. You know, like one last hurrah as such for that sort of, (laughs) for that sort of fishing. Um, You know, I, I definitely, I'm not going to be running off, you know, to the other busy big fish circuit waters, you know, from here, from here on, like definitely not. Um, Like, there's still a big part of me that wants to do that sort of fishing and that would love to catch them sort of carp. Mm. But like I say, when you, you, you can like ascertain like what is required to catch them. And I think you've got to look at that sometimes against what you're prepared to give um, and how it fits in with the rest of your life and yeah. everything else as well. And, you know, if you've got a few less commitments, you know, this, that, or the other, or you just really want to make the sacrifices to give what is required, then do you know what I mean? Fair dues. They're an incredible carp to fish for. But um, like I said, a couple of times this spring, I I was so close to just booking a tunnel ticket and just going and getting some piece in France or Belgium or Holland or something. So close. So tempted. Like a couple of my mates were over there. Dan, actually Kilgore. Yeah. And just have it, just having a lovely time, pretty much on his own catching great carp, you know, and I was like, 
I know I'm going to a lake where there's already 12, 14 lads there for the week. So you're already, you've got 15th choice, you know, behind 14 other good lads. All of so it sounds granite as well. You know what I mean? It just sort of becomes a bit like, yeah, where does it start? Thankfully, everyone is sound. Like, yeah, you did uh, say it's a really nice, like, yeah, and and also like, kind of sound like I'm bagging on Stone Acres here as well. But the, the, I think a lot of lakes were incredibly busy this spring yeah. as well. Like, I was chatting to a lot of other lads that were fishing different different lakes around the country, and they were all mega busy as well, mm. like really, really busy. Um, so I don't think it was that lake alone. I just, for whatever reason. There's yeah, it's the a lot of lads spending a lot of time. Yeah, it's busy. It's busy. For you, I think Al said it as well. I think I'm trying to think when he said it. I think he might have said it in a SIP interview or whatever. That feeling of of time, what it requires, but also the precious nature of it and not being able to actually angle is a is a yeah. tough thing. Funny that I, I saw the clip on Insta yesterday of Al. Uh, it was from his old SIP interview. Yes. I and him it. saying, like, I, th- I think it was... I can't remember what the context was, but I'm sure it was about him doing more in Europe and doing the sort of fishing that he does. And him saying that he just can't hack the idea of turning up at a lake and not being able to angle for them properly. Mm. Or like, you know, knowing where they are and just not being able to get near them. Or, you know, knowing that you've got to wait four or five nights, like to get in an area where you might have a chance if they're still there. And that's, you know, I'm I'm the same as well. It burns the living daylights out of me now. I hate it. I want to catch them carp. Still a big part of me that wants to do that and wants them in the album. But like when you know what you've got to go through to get them, it's like, oh, it's, is it? I don't know. Where do you sit like, on that? That that whole because that has become. I, think, I sway around with it. Do you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like last year, I was like, "This is the bollocks. I love it." Yeah, you know, because everything went well this year. I've been like, "This is shit. I'm not enjoying it." Get in the me slightest. on that tunnel. <laughs> get me, get me. Yeah, just like get me to some peace and quiet. Um, so yeah, I do. I I I definitely sway around with it. But I've always been a bit like that anyway. Have you? I'm like, yeah, not just, that fixed. Quite like quite happy just to ditch plans and just head like, you know, to whatever the next brightest light is or yeah. just like whatever feels good as well. Like I think, cause I just think, you know, as soon as you stop enjoying something, what's the, I think, I don't know, maybe I've got a low tolerance level for it. I know a lot of lads just like, just crack on through. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem to bother them. They've got really like, just you know, on. high sort of resilience level for stuff like that. Lads like miles and that yeah. I'm like, man, Fair that's, play. Yeah just seemingly kind of unfazed by that sort of stuff. Like I couldn't care less how hard a lake is. Put me on, I'll do like 80 blank nights a year, hundred blank nights. Don't care. Don't care how hard a lake is. But if, if I just feel like I'm fishing against other anglers different, and I just can't get near them and I can't angle, if I've only got myself to blame for blanking, fine. Do you know what I mean? You can go home, you can debrief yourself and you can be like, work harder like put more effort into finding them, fish better spots, you know, do better prep, whatever. But if you're just getting down there and you're just like, I just can't get near them, then that's the different, that changes it in my head personally. If you didn't have that European sort of experience release, that little voyage with regards to your anger, do you think you'd have, you'd have jacked it in, burnt out by now? What, carp fishing? Yeah. In general, I don't know. Like, I mean, I, (laughs) I burn out regularly. Anyway, I mean, full. I always have. Like, I was chatting to you on the phone the other day, wasn't I? And I was saying, um, so I'm putting a book together. Yes. Finally putting my own book together. I've written loads over the years. I've always really enjoyed writing. Like, yeah. I, I love it. Um, always really enjoyed reading. Always thoroughly enjoyed stories. Like, they were really kind of, um, you know, uh, instrumental when I was younger in shaping the sort of fishing that I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it you know, Hutchie's books, mm. Terry's books, obviously that really shaped like reading those. And, and it still does. I think it's something about the way you can craft a story. That's a little bit different to film. Like I love film, watch loads of carp films, but for some reason, a story is slightly different. I think it's cause you can't see it. I don't know. So it's a bit more left to your imagination. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, so I've, I've been putting it together and I've basically stretched all my fishing along a timeline 
which I've never done before because I've only ever written yeah single bits for point. like single sessions here, single sessions there, a season on here or a season on there. So I like finally put it all out along a timeline to see where it's fitted. And it's unbelievably patchy what I've done. Yeah, you said this, didn't you? Yeah, so Flitted patchy. Flitted around here, there and everywhere. Flitted around, like failed campaigns. Like I've, I'll always have these like big grand plans for stuff. And then whatever work will get on top or something will happen or like this, that or the other and it falls. But that's just the nature of the beast. But you're putting them in the and book, aren't you? Yeah, I'm putting it all in. I'm putting it all in. And that's probably not a bit. Um, and this is, I think I said this to you, it's probably not a bit that everybody associates with you or sees. When I see it, I always thought that like your timeline would be very like clinical and calculated, like box off that chop to that job done, job nice. done, I'll revisit there. It's not the case. No, it's it? all over the place. It's all over the place. Oh, like, uh, you know, I mean, when I was younger, like predominantly I just raced bikes, fishing just fitted in in between. And then um, uh, I wrecked my knee. So I did a bit more fishing on Reedsmere for a few years, then went to uni, didn't fish at all for a good few years, did a little bit down there, but sort of not a lot. Um, came back, did a bit up north, but then moved straight back down yeah. to do my teaching again. Didn't really fish for a couple of years, um, and sort of yeah, it's been it's been really up and down, been all over the place. Like I reckon I've only I, I was working it all out, and I reckon most years I've only fished somewhere between like twenty and fifty nights a year, which is massively surprising. Like, yeah, I think most people would imagine I've done a lot I've more than that. More. And there's been the the odd season. But even when I fished the car park, my first year on the car park, when I caught the dustbin and the others, I only did 25, 24 nights. Um, yes. But I've often done that. Even, e, e, even then, I did like, I think I did four trips at the start of the year yeah. on the car park, caught the dustbin and another one. And then I didn't go back until the autumn, pretty much. Um, be- just because work had stacked up and and I just couldn't. I often think rather than spread myself thin, yeah, concentrate your effort. Concentrate on like one thing at a time because if I do, if I try and do like a night here, miss a week, a night there, it never seems to come to anything. It's so hard on them sort of waters to make anything happen doing that. I You've think, got to be consistent. I think people be quite surprised by that, mate. Like you're saying, the number of nights, but also like the fact that now. Maybe people just see you as as an angler with regards to the teaching and stuff's gone. That you thought they'd be doing a lot more, but yeah, like as I said, burnout wise, it's clear you do those concerted efforts. There's a bit of leeway in the middle for life, and it's it's quite a decent. I'm, I'm saying this, it's quite a decent balance with regards to it all. I think like it ain't like it's a bit of a pendulum swing. That's the only yeah. sort of yeah, yeah. I suppose it's but, like all or nothing. But um, yeah. but. but I, I, I don't think that's just me either. Like no. I know a lot of lads um, that, that, that fish for big carp on them sort of lakes that it is all or nothing. They'll fish really hard for a little spell, whatever in the spring and in the autumn, and then just not really fish for the rest of the year, just work, do family stuff or whatever, and condense all their efforts really hard into like a six or an eight week spell mm. around the key times, you know, like mid April, through to like end of May or when they spawn. spawn. Yeah. Whatever. And then again, around the sort of like, you know, um, that autumn, yeah. Early like September summer, yeah. to, you know, possibly early October, mid October, around them couple of harvest moons and stuff, just hit it hard there and just forget the rest of the year. And I do know quite a few lads that, that, that do that. Yeah. That um, makes sense. I just think it's incredibly difficult to keep up the intensity of big carp fishing, week in week out yeah. and I like I've always said and I, I'm really lucky getting to interview and speak to so many lads a bit like mm. yourself I suppose mm. doing these you know you get to like you get insights into everybody's sort of you know views and mindset on it all and all the rest don't you and I think like um, uh, I've always sort of thought that the biggest sort of like defining factor in making lads successful at big carp fishing is how well they can orchestrate the rest of their life to allow those two or three nights a week every week. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've spoke to, as you say, spoke to a few people who sort of are in probably a different camp in terms of they they will fish consistently, it'll be routine and they'll do two or three nights. But sometimes, and they'll fully admit it and they have admitted it, 
that there's periods of times where they're just going through the motions and that's mm. hard. It's, yeah, totally. Whereas May, always a mega month, September through to whenever, you know what I mean, things mm. slow up, they are still fishing two or three nights a week, but they're in a different mindset for those two or three nights of the week because yeah. they know. Yeah, yeah. So and I just find I, I just fish so much better when I've got that sort of intensity. Yeah, that makes sense. If And I kind of only fish like that. Anyway, I think that's one of the reasons that I find it hard to do too much of it because of the intensity that I fish with when I'm at the lake. I put mm. everything into it, really every trip, and it just it wrecks you. It's really hard, you know. Mm. Don't sleep much, don't always eat that well, drink way too much coffee, all the rest, you know what I mean? It takes it out of you physically. Um, yeah. You put everything into it and it's draining, you know, come back, shot to pieces. Definitely, I don't find fishing relaxing in the slightest. Is it the se- Let's let's take Europe and UK. So for you, I know it's not relaxing. Big carp, the, the whole European side to your fishing is that as intense? No, it, it's it's intense in a in a different way. It's intense often. It just in like a physic in like a physically challenging way. Maybe because you're dealing with big like big kit, heavy boats, or like you know big batteries. Mm. Lots of moving often, especially on the big public lakes and stuff, you know, tend to rarely be sat in a swim for more than a couple of nights, you know, and then it's, you know, break and rebuild, move lake, rebuild again. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's physically challenging. And when you get it right as well, sometimes it's just it just like sleep deprivation be- just yeah. because you're catching so many. And you're keen to make the most of it as well. Do you know what I mean? You're only there for a short spell. When it's going off, you want to, you know, you want to keep putting them back out and you want to keep doing it, you know, as well as you possibly can just to sort of reap it for the short time that you're there. Um, But I don't find it anywhere near as like mentally challenging because you're not, I'm not fishing for a target. I've just gone there for an experience. And that's the thing these days. I've, I've found it hard to articulate it and I still don't, it still doesn't really even sort of, I can't, I haven't quite grappled with it properly yet, but like, um, I was trying to work out like sort of what meant more to me. Some of the big, you know, mantelpiece carp that I've caught over the years or some of the fish that I've caught in Europe. And like, I don't look at them in like any different way, even though I might've invested a couple of seasons effort in catching whatever X, Y, or Z or something over here. And I might've just gone on a one-off trip and caught a mega one in Europe because of the quality of that experience. That's what kind of invests me in the memory of it. Right. If that makes sense. That, Sometimes you it's compare, you do compare them then to Heather versus that mega one you caught with Samir. Yeah. Do like you, I don't, com- no, I mean, I don't think one is worth more than the other. No, no, I honestly don't because the experience of being out at Orellana, for example, the scenery, the place, just the vastness, you know, the fact that we did seven nights and only had one bite and it was that thing. Yeah. Like, uh, and, you know, really the experience of being out there in the boat and netting that thing, the buzz was just as big as as when I caught Heather. Really? Yeah. That really totally. surprises me, man. I know, and I think a lot of people probably think, nah. Like, but but honest to God, it's, it's true. Because a lot of, and that, a, a lot of that week to week campaign fishing can be quite painful. Yeah. It's not always that fun. You're just going because you're driving towards an end result. And I think like, I don't know how to sum it up, but like um, one lad, when he caught Heather, shouted freedom, not Heather. Yeah, relief. And I think than- there's a little bit of a, there's something in that. I think it's, there is a sense of relief as opposed to just elation that you've caught it. Yeah. I think when you're chasing a target, it becomes as much a relief as a joy at the end because you just want out, but you don't want to throw the towel in. Like I know one lad um, who went back to somewhere else this year just because he had a tough year last year. Don't think he really enjoyed the fishing, but he was like, no, nah, I'm not being beaten. He's like, I'm going to go back there. and I don't really think he wanted to go back. Right, but he just went back because he didn't didn't really want to be beaten by it, and you know I think there's it 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 definitely gets like that. I'm like 
these days I'm a lot happier just to be like, nah, I'm done. I'm out. I'm out. Um, Job done. Well, not even if I've not caught, you just so, you know, a couple of lads said to me, oh, you know, surely you're not going to leave Stone Age because without catching Kevs or No Name, I'd be like, I don't, I don't care. I don't, you know, I don't want them that much. I'd love to catch one of them. Incredible, incredible carp, but I'm not going to spend the next five years there. Do you think there is a Try- carp out there now that would no. make you do enough or no, 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 no. I just, I just don't look at my carp fishing like that anymore. Like the, the quality of the week to week experience or, or not even week to week, just the, like the quality of the experience of each fishing trip is the thing that's important to me. Right. It's like how I can fish the surroundings that I'm in and the people I'm surrounded by. Okay. They're the key things. Big carp, whatever. Like, honest to God, I would rather go and fish a really nice, quiet little local lake that was really beautiful, you know, nice natural swims, style of fishing I enjoyed for like nice oldie worldy 20 pounders, the odd 30 and maybe a 40, but I wouldn't, not even that fast, than go and sit somewhere I'm not really enjoying to go and fish for a load of biggins. A hundred percent. But I just think that's a natural progression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. You know, like I've, I've been carp fishing for a long time now and um, yeah, I definitely think maybe it's just getting older as well. Just become a bit more critical about how you spend your time. I think you're not old, mate. Whereas, I don't know. You have been doing it a long time to be in all fairness, but I yeah, I mean, thirty odd years. I've been cut fishing for longer than thirty years now. Yeah, since like nineteen eighty eight, I started. So I was going to do the math on that. Thirty four, thirty five years. Yeah, it's a long time. Um, you know, so inevitably, what you want from it is going to change, isn't it? And I think it'd be weird if it, if it didn't. If it didn't, weird. yeah, hundred percent, yeah, for sure. And and like like I was saying to you before, like these days, like, I know what you've got to give to catch some of them biggins from certain places. Yeah. And so I look at them, and like I say, I'll just I'll either think there's a couple of waters back home that I I really sort of should go and fish. They've got amazing biggins in, um, beautiful ones, really close to to my house. But I sort of know what I'd have to give. To do it. And the style of fishing and stuff to catch them. And I'm a bit like, I just don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to do it, basically. Talk to me about Europe. For you, mate, when mm-hmm. I say Europe and European fishing and, and adventures, when did that all come into play? What does that all mean to you with regards to angling? Like, uh, it, it first came in when I was teaching, basically when teaching commitments had got, had got hectic mm. and I was struggling like to do the big carp fishing week in, week out back home. Um, it just became a much more exciting prospect to have two or three trips to Belgium or whatever um, in the holidays, go and have a lovely time, catch some beautiful carp. You know what they're like out there. Black, mm. brown, little wilted fins, beautiful. Just look like any other beautiful English carp. Um, I was like, this is incredible. So exciting just to turn up at lakes and be like, I don't know what's in there. No idea. As opposed to being like, oh, well, I know that one's going to be that big and that one's going to be that big. And, you know, mate, you had that one a couple of weeks ago at 30. To just not know was just so great. Um, so, yeah, started going to Belgium then. And because it was it was easy as well in terms of sort of, you know, uh, two rods, English kit, brolly, little rucksack, you know, cheap ticket from the post office. Yeah. Not too far a drive. Uh, you know, we'd often leave after school, like on a Friday and you'd have rods out by Saturday morning and you do like three nights, four nights or whatever um, in the school holidays. And yeah, that was sweet. So that was kind of how I started, started getting into it. Um, and then I always fancied doing some of the big water stuff, but I, I always felt like that sort of fishing naturally needed a bit more time. Yeah. And also the kit as well. Um, and I kind of, I didn't really feel like I could, inve- like could afford to invest a couple of grand in, big boats, outboards, batteries, echoes, all that sort of thing, unless I was going to do a bit of it. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of, yeah, it wasn't really until um, around stopping teaching, to be fair, that I sort of thought, yeah, I can I can probably do at least one of these trips a year now, maybe a couple of years. Um, and a few of the lads locally as well, some of the Ringwood lads, they'd been doing a bit of that sort of fishing for years just nice and quietly to be fair to themselves. Yeah. Um, 
always come back with amazing stories. And I was always like, oh, that looks the bollocks. Somebody described it to me as like a, another big car panger is like a pressure release. Yeah. Because the circuit here. It's the pressure cooker. becomes congested. It becomes a pressure cooker. And also a lot of people, and you yourself included, and we talked about this before we came on camera, uh, almost your reputation as an angler, you see it as you've got to keep catching, you've got to keep sort of proving yourself, not that you need to, but mm. you know what I'm saying, as your stock value is related to what you catch and how active you are. Yeah, totally. You and, can't ignore that. Yeah, and, and that, release you don't really have that broad you don't have the this is kev's you're you've got to catch him this year because yeah. you're on yeah do you know what i mean or whatever totally it just yeah it's, it's so cliche but the the sense of freedom is just is amazing um after fishing i mean actually to be fair my first i, I reread it last week as i was reading through some of my old writing um was one of the first ever times i went was over to the kempish yeah uh with james davies um, James Turner, Embryo James, yeah, um, and Phil Buckley. Um, in so it would have been, it was the autumn of I think two thousand, and it was either nine or ten. I can't remember right. crappy years and dates, but um, it, it was while we were fishing the car park, and I obviously wrote that bit of the story at sort of at the time I was fishing there. So it was, do you know what I mean? It was it was fresh, and I'd written about it that I was just really bored, sat on the car park. Right. Um, and, and I was, when I think about it now, like I'd, I'd caught a few of them and I was sort of sitting up the top end, really fishing for Arthur, which often used to get caught from that snags chair sort of corner. And like, it's barely bigger than this room. It's, you know what I mean? It's like claustrophobic. You, yeah. yeah. If you put like six of these rooms together, that's about the bit of water that you're fishing in. Um, mm -hmm. And to be going up there week after week after week, knowing that you're probably only really wanting to get in one of them two swims, fish the same couple of spots, put the same couple of rigs out so precisely. I just, I just got bored of it. I just got bored of it. Um, you know, again, you know, some lads have got the, the drive and the willpower to sort of see that sort of thing through, like, yeah. you know, quite, like, I think you gotta be quite stubborn. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes for that sort of, you know, I read some big carp stories sometimes from some of the lads and I listen to some of the stories and I just think, nah, I just, I would have, I would have canned it by that point. Um, That's interesting, mate, as well, isn't it? Because you've caught them. You've done it like the car park is the pinnacle, isn't it? I mean, especially of that generation. However, the dustbin, you think, yeah, I don't know. I thought, I thought you'd be very much in that. Not regimented, but that like, which you are in spells. I, guess. I am, but just in short spells. That I think, yeah. like I say, putting my book together, that's the one thing that I realised is I've always hit it hard in short spells and I just blow out, have like four, five, six, eight weeks off or whatever, and then go hard again. And if it doesn't happen in them short spells, I'm happy to just hold my hands up it. and be like, nah, it's cool, okay, whatever. It's not, you know, it hasn't worked. It's like the ones I caught from Roach Pit in the winter in January and stuff as well. Again, that was only like, I think it was like six nights fishing and two bait ups. I just had a bit of a hunch where they were going to be a couple of bait ups, six nights and like had the best winters fishing that I've ever had. Um, and like that area did a couple more and a couple more big ones, but I'd, I'd already, I'd sort of canned yeah, it by that yeah. point And I'd not cause not like arrogantly walking away, but just cause I can only keep up that sort of thing for, that's short spells. Mate. I need to get the book. When's the book out? And also, uh, it won't be, well, if I get it done. You will. Um, <laughs> this Christmas, hopefully. Like, oh, well, wow. Maybe like November time. Wicked. Yeah. So, uh, so my plan, I mean, what is it now? T um, early June? Yeah. End of June. I reckon I've got like six weeks, probably six or eight weeks right in. Um, and then hopefully I'll be able to string a bit of fishing together, September, October. Um, but I'm just going to knuckle down for the summer. Ironically, your book writing Whilst is like, all spawned out yeah. like crisp packets. Ironically, crisp packets. your book writing seems to be a lot like your cart fishing, mate. Six weeks of intense, hardcore go at it and then hopefully fit some fishing in at the other side. Yeah, I don't know why it always ends up like that because I, I, yeah, it's not really intentional. It's just the way it always ends up. I like it, mate. No, um, that's you. I like and, it. Yeah. I like doing other stuff as well. Like I said to you before, I've been doing loads of riding recently. Yeah. Um, been down to Cornwall quite a few times that's your spiritual the spring aim, isn't surfing it? i love it down there yeah if it wasn't for carp fishing 100 i would still be in, in cornwall i'd never have left 
It was only carp fishing that dragged me back up country a bit. You were telling me you like horticulture, mate. You're like garden. You love a garden. Just like, like I, well. I, it's just all like outdoorsy, elemental sort of stuff. I hate being in an office sat behind a computer, yeah. basically. Um, yeah, it's like doing stuff, working with my hands. Um, surfing in so many respects is so similar to carp fishing. Huge amount of time spent sat around waiting and then little short spells of, of, of activity, um, waiting for the weather, waiting for the right winds, waiting for the swell. It's, it's really sort of, you know, really similar, like sort of like the pattern. I've, I've done a couple of big surf trips, like six weekers. Jeez. Um, and the, just like living out of a van, basically down the West coast of France and into Spain. And the, the, the pattern of those sort of trips is, you could so easily just exchange the rods for a surfboard. Really? It's so similar. Yeah, it's so similar. I could probably see. Yeah. Do you think you'd ever do? It's all about like first and last light. Yeah. And, you know, like the days are often a write off. It's all about, yeah, first light and last light when the wind has dropped. Um, the waves are always better, glassy, nice in the mornings, less people in. Um, you're waiting around often yeah. for the swell. You're looking for the quiet spot. You might turn up somewhere and there's like, 15, 20 people in, you're like, oh no, like, was good. you know, so you're, you're looking for a, a peak a bit further down or a different break or something that's quieter. And there's, you know, there's so many similarities between it's, the two. It's interesting. I was, but I, well, you, you know a lot better than I do, but I spoke to Rob because obviously he's climbing, isn't he now? Yep. No carp yeah. fishing. I did yeah. the whole hard sell. I'll sort you out of some gear, Rob. <laughs> and he told me you want to come back. And he was like, that's how, mate, I get, the same fix that I get from all those epic captures that I've had in like half an hour trying to scale a bit yeah. of rock. Yeah. Rob, you know what I mean? I think Rob always looked at it in a really pragmatic sense. He yeah. was like, all it is, it, you know, fishing is basically like the, 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 the buzz when you catch one, it's just stimulating your serotonin and your endorphins and whatever else, like in your, but it's just a chemical release. Yeah. You can get that in different ways. And He's like, I can go climbing and I can get that whenever I want, basically, on tap. Whereas in fishing, you might have to work for two or three months for one of those highs because that's how long it takes to catch a, a big target beach. fish or, or, yeah. or whatever. And it's it's funny, you know, it's like I don't get that sort of buzz from if I'm just catching loads. Yeah, it's not you, is the, it? No, the buzz just disappears straight away, um, you know, and then it just becomes like it's away again. And sometimes you're like, Oh man, if it's the middle of the night, you're just like that trip in France with Elmo last spring. Too um, much. Yeah. Like we'd caught a load. We'd had like 25 or something already. It was the last night. Big Richard turned up um, that afternoon. We had a load of big film pieces to wrap up the following day. And we were going to move to another lake. So it was basically going to be like a big, you know, there was like a big day ahead. Yeah. And um, it was the last night. We hadn't really slept. It was all snag fishing, like locked up snag fishing. So you're always on edge, a couple of bleeps basically. And you had to be like on your rods kind of thing. All the rods were pegged down and all that sort of thing. And um, yeah, this last night, like I, I caught a couple quite early and I was shattered. Elmo hadn't even got out of bed actually. Um, and um, the last two times I went out or the last three times, I was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to horse a load of bait. I like, I could have not put the rod back out, but I yeah. just didn't have that in me to not like, I had to put it back out because something special. It you was the know. last night and I was like, it's got to go back out. But each time I was just loading more and more bait in, in like, in a vain attempt to stave them off for a few more <laughs> hours. Sabotage. But it just did, it just didn't work. Like I caught more and they got, and they got bigger that night as well. Like, um, yeah, I had, I think I had four, in the end that night, like, yeah, one just under 40, a um, couple of other 40 pounders and another one off it. But like the fish, but yeah, just look of, mega mate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really fussed about catching too many. Um, well, out there, an odd one now and again, that's fine for me. Out there, what are you, obviously you referenced that Elmo session, what other, what other sort of significant, and I know I'm not talking about this all significant, but things that really sort of have piqued your interest, sort of, I don't know, really captivated you more than anything else with regards to that European scene. What, what's it been? I mean, 
loads of it. God, there's just there's so much. That's my trouble as well. I want to go into like I'd love to go and do it all. Yeah. I feel like you could have ten lifetimes and not and not experience it all, you know. Um and every time I go and do a little bit of something new as well, I'll be like, shit, get me back out there to go and do some more of that. But obviously time, realities like all the rest. It's yeah. just, you know, unless you're f- like fully making a living from it and you know you can work it into your job like some boys do these days and you can do half a dozen trips a year or whatever then it's different isn't it but average joe's you what one trip a year two trips a year yeah takes you a, takes you a long time to get through stuff doesn't it if that makes sense you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Trip, the big investment in money you know like we we're saying before that trip when i i almost um went to France instead of Stoney's one of the trips this spring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reckon it would have cost me a grand to go for a week. And I, it's, you know, it's a lot of money, isn't it? It's not cheap, um, is it? It's not, you know, travel, diesel, all the rest. Um, but yeah, like everything from like the little intimate canals to wanting to do some more of the big water stuff. I'd love to catch a Chantico one. I'd mm. love to catch a Cassian one. I'd love to catch an Orient one. Um, I'd love to catch a Salagu one. You know, for me, them four are like... Holy Grail, yeah. They're like yeah. the European Grails, them four. Um, but equally so, I know like each one of them really is like a two-weeker. It's a two-week trip. It's it's like, it's a lot of prep. You're talking about the best part of a week either side mm. as well. I reckon to prep kit and then sort everything out afterwards. So you're looking at like, it's like three, four weeks um, you know, per, like per trip, isn't it really? And, and a couple of grand, probably. So it's, yeah, they, you know, they're a big investment, them sort of trips. So yeah, I don't know. I'd love to do some of them. What you want to do? You want to do it as part tab. of, do it on the Baitworks tab or do it on somebody else's yeah, tab, mate. I, Get it off there. I, th- I think, you know, I, a lot of last year was spent with cameras behind me as well. You know, we, we mentioned it before, didn't we? And mm. it's like, I don't mind filming at all been really lucky to get to work with some great great cameramen over the years do you know what i mean dan rich joe that does the um the filming for thinking now joe brazil like top lads i happily spend every day of the week with them boys yeah but the feeling when you go fishing on your own and the feeling of when you've got a couple of cinematographers with you videographers it's just totally different it's totally different. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, yeah. you know, there's a lot of money riding off the back of it. Um, and there's a lot of effort going into it. And at the end of the day, you've got, a, <laughs> as Daryl said, when I interviewed him there, he's like, I've, he's got to put the meat on the deck. Mm. And it sort to a point, it does feel like that. Like I, I try my best not to worry about any of that at all. And like, just enjoy being there and just fish as I, as I would, and for the most part, for the most part, you can, but there's no two ways about it. It changes it massively. Yeah, it definitely does, doesn't it? And I suppose if that for you, you've done the UK thing, okay, you film there and it and it's sort of all right. But if you've got your European sort of bit of freedom and then you load it with cameras as well. Yeah, then it's not freedom anymore. It's yeah. it's sort of more work, isn't it? So, um, but yeah, you know, equally so an amazing way to be able to, to travel um, and to experience some of that stuff. But yeah, I don't know. Like I'd be happy, like in all honesty, Hass, I'd be, I'd be happy with like one European trip a year to, to myself just to go. And I, th- I think the other difficult thing when you film as well is you tend to go for safer options. Yeah. Where you know, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to catch a couple. Yeah. Um, so, and because most of my, most of my European trips now for a long time have all been filmed. So you don't, you don't explore like you would. You yeah. don't sort of go, oh, we'll just go and have a look here for a few days, see what's going on. I don't really, yeah, I've heard a bit of a real, I don't know. You know, you don't really do much of that. And you're always on a bit of a tight, like tight, tight time frame and stuff as well. So it changes it. But yeah, I th- you know, I think for me, I'd be more than happy just like one nice European trip a year. Um Spring or autumn, whichever. Uh, autumn, sure. I think. I quite like the autumn out yeah. there. Big French waters in the autumn. There's like a particular feel about the atmosphere and that of it all. Um, yeah, I'd be more than happy, mate. What about the scene getting busier, mate, out there? Because it seems that within the last 
three years, maybe post COVID. Can't remember really. I can't put a time scale to it. It seems like everybody is going over to either the public lakes in France, Belgian canals, even to the likes of Croatia, Hungary, etc. Yeah. They're even going further afield to sort of there. I know yeah. that there are commercials like Parco, etc. But I'm talking yeah. about public lakes. Yeah, the public stuff seem to have absolutely boomed. Mm, um, definitely. What, what, what you th- have you noticed that? What are your thoughts on that? Because M- yeah, massively. Like I think, and we will talk about influence in due course because you are definitely as cringe as I hate saying it, but you are definitely an influencer with regards to subculture, that whole subsurface movement and that. But in regards to Europe as well, the documented stuff you've done, a lot of people have gone, oh yeah, I'll have a bit of that. And and they've gone out subsequently. How do you feel about all that, mate? In honesty, like uncomfortable. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Really. um, And I've always tried, like all the early writing that I did, I was like purposely not taking any scenics. Okay. And everything that was, te- was like, so there was no way that you could pin anything to anywhere. And I'd often write the stories with a few details in that weren't strictly true about the nature of the, if it was a small lake, I might've said it was a really big place. Yeah. Okay, cool. Or, uh, you know, wouldn't have given away anything that would have kind of given away the, just because I sort of felt like, you know, that, that a lot of them places, you know, that we were told about or sort of got the nod about or that we just found or whatever, always conscious that there's there's sets of local lads whose home lakes they are that fish there week, week in, week out. And, you know, the last thing that they want is a load of English boys turning up. Um, and, and undoubtedly it's, it's caused friction yeah. at places. And, you know, um, so, but it's, it is really difficult because like I say, I've always loved like every pursuit gets documented. Doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Whether that is like skiing or snowboarding or surfing yeah. or skating or climbing or, or anything. And, and they all like climbing same problems with like, you know, walls getting busy. The, the, um, I forget what they called the, um, like the chocks that get put in the rocks to like, right. that. there's like problems with that on walls that get climbed too often. And, stuff like that. And there's like friction with sort of like localism and this and the surfing, massive localism problems. I bet there is. Huge. Yeah. Like I've been ordered out of the water before now. Have you? Yeah. In Fort Ventura. Yeah. Do- no way. Yeah. Ordered. There wasn't even anyone in. I was on my own. And when he said get out? Yeah. Some local guys were basically trying to order me out. What did you do about that, Gaz? I can't imagine you getting violent. What did you do? I, st- I stayed in. Yeah. To be fair, they sort of gave up in the end. But um, that's mental. You know, Locals. You ever had anything like that on a lake? Bro- you have any aggro sort of abroad? Um, yeah, I've had my van keyed. Um, right. I've had my van keyed. Uh, I've had sort of a couple of little bits of sort of like frosty receptions here and there. Uh, Benji, um, he got all his tires slashed. Yeah, yeah. Benji. The little Belgian lakes. Um, and, all, all, you know, all of that is a direct consequence of like increasing pressure. Mm. Um so I've always found it a very difficult line to because, like I say, because like I love photography, I love writing, I love the way you know pursuits are documented, and um, it is inevitable that's going to happen. So I just think finding the right way to do it is the important thing, and like not giving too much away because you don't have to, you know, sort of, you know, you can write a great story or make a great film without giving too much away. I think, but it is it's a difficult line to toe. Mm, um, but that said there's so much unexplored water in Europe and people just end up just going to the same places yeah, yeah, yeah either because they've seen it in a film or they've read it in a story or whatever so naturally they want to go there but you know I've always said you know some of them places that I've been to there's another hundred places out there like that they're not they're not really special as such there's loads of other ones out there and I think half the time the exciting thing is is going and finding some of them. Yeah, yeah, but no. it, it, yeah, like I say, it is a it is a really difficult one. I think it's far easier to sort of um, hide the hide the location of a venue through writing than it is through making a film. Yeah, yeah, definitely, especially with drones and stuff these days. And like you know, I know quite a lot of the public lakes in France have had have had a lot of problems um, with them just getting busier and. 
what sort of like or f- from what I can gather at least anyway, what tends to happen is like lakes will be like the guard to pesh sort of turn a fairly blind eye to the odd night being done, people sleeping on the bank but winding the rods in, they're sort of okay with that sort of thing. As soon as places start getting busy, it all just gets locked down and then all the restrictions come in, no boats, can't fish out more than a hundred meters, you know, can't sleep on the bank. Seen that happen on a couple of lakes just this year that have seen a big rise in pressure. So it's kind of it's a bit of an elephant in the room and you know, no, it's not nice it's not a nice topic to talk about. No one really wants to talk about it, but the industry's growing and I think it's important that, you know, we all sort of find a way to like to you know, to deal with it sensitively. Yeah. Like I say, it isn't just exclusive to carp fishing either. It's it's something that, you know It's a feature, isn't it? More yeah, like a do really it, yeah. sort of, you know, Say, for example, like a really good little wave in Cornwall, um, if that gets, you know, a film done on it or a load of exposure on Insta or something like that, like the 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 physical infrastructure of the little villages can't cope with yeah. the amount of people turning up, you know, to, to surf. There's like real issues at some places. Um, and with the rise in like webcams and stuff like that as well yeah, of course. with surfing. Do you know what I mean? I could fire my phone up now. And I could check the waves, yeah. thousands of breaks across the world uh, and see if it's any good or not and turn up. It'd be a yeah. bit like the equivalent of, I don't know, like having a camera placed on the point on St. John's and waiting to see if they were showing before turning up. Yeah. You know, surfing's a lot further down the line in, in all that sort of exposure cycle, if you like, and working out how to deal with it and stuff. But they're just a lot more protective. Nowhere gets named and because of the nature of shooting waves, you can be quite careful. Yeah, to, pretty nondescript. To not give away the yeah, yeah, yeah. What so about it's... what about the fishing element with regards to that? Have you noticed that the fishing getting any any trickier because of the pressure on on any of the places? I or mean, not really. I haven't really been for the last few years. Yeah. Other than that trip out to Spain, yeah, which is mega. Like, hardly saw any other carp anglers, and yeah, that's the special. Just, it was, yeah, it was beautiful. I know there are. It does get busy out there. Um, spoke to Samir quite a few times and sort of, you know, on some of them little rivers and stuff like that. And he's been like, I think where there's only one or two spots on a lot of them as well. It doesn't take many people to fill it up. Does it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I haven't like, I've only done, only done two European trips. No, three, sorry. Since, um, the autumn of 2019. Right. Okay. So Be interesting to yeah. see that, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, I know loads of lads that were out there this spring yeah. and um, yeah, caught loads. Yeah. There's a lot of anglers though. I was speaking to people and they're like, I've been to here, I've been to there, been to there, been to there, been to the everywhere around. C- couldn't get on lots of the places, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. I've, um, I've heard the same reports, mate. Yeah, fair. but again, it's like, it's everyone going to the same places. Yeah, yeah. Um, that That's the trouble. If people were taking a chance and going to you know, any of the others that you don't know the names of the bits of blue on the map. Be a different story. Be very different. They've all got carpet. They've all got good carpet, big carp. Sometimes it's easier to follow though than sort of, of course it's a safe pathway. option. And you can yeah. sit like, like say, you know, I do it myself as well. You know, if, if I'm going to go for one week this autumn, you know, realistically, I'm probably not going to take a chance on a wild goose chase so somewhere on the map, I'm probably going to go to somewhere that I know has got plenty of big ones in and is a good bet for that time of year. But the trouble is now everyone knows where is a good bet for that time of year and where all the big ones live. Yeah, the info. Yeah. Um, th- that's the thing, like access to info is so wildly different to what it was even 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know? There's a lot more documentation of it all. For, for you, and I, t- I referenced it earlier about influence, how do you feel about that whole movement, I don't to say movement, you you are obviously top 5% of anglers, the carpy, keep it really low, all that sort of, do you know what I mean? Those cliches in there, but that is very much sub. It's a lot of the pinnacle with regards to imagery and, and that whole style and, and feel of like our carp scene, whether that be home or abroad, whatever it is, but it definitely resonates with an awful lot of people and influences an awful lot of people with regards to, maybe tackle choice, choice of imagery, things like that. Even clothing, obviously clothing's available. We've got a sub t-shirt on right now. Nice that. Um, what, how do you feel about that, about creating something, about being, 
associated with having an influence over the wider sort of culture, mate? Again, mate, really uncomfortable. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. You're really uncomfortable. I try not to think about it because I think if you did think about it, it would influence what you did. Right. And I just feel like you can't, I, you know, I definitely don't want to think about that. So I just, you know, everything I've always done in print, uh, you know, and like the lads I've interviewed and I just, I try and just look for, and this sort of stuff is done in like spade loads in different pursuits. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Again, do you yeah. know what I mean? Like surfing, there's like four or five subs. There's, there's not just, there's not just that. Um, and there's like another 30 or 40 people making these beautiful cinematic story-based films and like all, you know what I mean? There's so, there's so many creative people doing stuff in, in those other pursuits. So I think like in like print at least anyway, and the sort of more like, cause I've been doing it like 10 years or so now and there wasn't really anything like that at all Yeah, at, at the time. Um, so it's, it's always stood out, I think a little bit as a bit of an outlier, a little bit of something sort of, you know, just done in a different way to the way everything else was done. Not that everything else was done badly, obviously far from it. It was all done really well, but I always tried to sort of do everything a little bit sort of differently, but I only just ever based it on like, you know, again, you know, sort of coming from teaching photography and all that sort of thing as well. It was just like, you know, sort of looking for good photography and not yeah. necessarily photography that was just technically good. Like I like, to look for stuff that feels like it's authentic and has got a bit of heart and soul. I th there's a lot of photography out there these days that it might be pin sharp and beautiful and look great, but feels a bit dead, you know? And yeah. uh, in, in this last one, actually this issue three, Brad Chambers talked beautifully about, um, cause I was asking him about, obviously he's primarily doing the filmmaking now, isn't he? Yeah. And I was asking him about photography and how much of relevance he, he still feels it has and this, that and the other. And, he said, and it was really fascinating because I feel exactly the same. He's like, with, with digital these days, you can like look at a scene or look at something, rattle off 30 shots until you get just the right angle or whatever it is you want. But he was sort of saying for him, it's th the shot's dead by that point because what photography does really well is capture a single moment in time. Mm. If you've like tried to falsify that moment in time 35 times to get the perfect moment, you killed it. it kills it. Um, so I like a lot of stuff that's, I like the in-between frames or the ones that are not quite perfect. And that's why I, I like a lot of the old photography as well, because it was completely unselfconscious. There's way too much stuff out there that's really self-conscious, I think, these days. Yeah. Um, and again, I think that sort of kills it. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fine line. But I just try and, if I see something that I think is either like really interesting or is a, is a good shot, that's, you know, that's just my... That's my benchmark. Really, I thought, I thought it'd be that sort of answer, mate, with regards yeah. to if I'm honest. But, but, but and but, also just the, the just the sort of again, because I spend ninety eight percent of my angling life with lads that aren't in the industry and the yeah. scene. Yeah. Um. Hence, why there's always been a lot of lads in sub over the years, names that people probably won't recognise. There's been a couple more big names in these, you know, Daryl, Scott Lloyd, Miles, Alan, you know. Recognise those boys. Yeah, <laughs> but sort of historically, I've always used a lot of lesser known lads, lads like little Rob. Yeah. Um, and because, you know, I still think a lot of those boys are the best anglers that I've ever met. Yeah, definitely. 100%. And Rob's not alone. You know, there's, I could give you names of like half a dozen Colm Valley lads. Never ever. albums to die for yeah. or more biggins than anybody else. I know you wouldn't know him. You walk past him in the street. You wouldn't know who they were. Yeah. Um, you know, and they just do it for themselves. Catch biggins, ice men, just, you know, like all DKs mates, you know, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, that's so, but also there's, it's not just them lot. There's little, there's pockets of them guys 100%. out there everywhere. Um, and, you know, so kind of, I've always, wherever I can, tried to sort of encourage a few of them maybe to write or to let me interview them or what have you, because I feel like what they've got to say is just as exciting as what anyone else has got to say, if not more so, because generally they're balancing a full-time job and, you know, career, family and all the rest and still smashing places to pieces. Yeah. Just, on, ones. just on their own terms. Now, I know you've referenced, obviously, 
your influence with sub and, and that whole thing. But for you being the influencer, what I'm interested in is, is your influences. You've done an awful lot of angling over an extended period of time. You've mixed in very sort of high end, top end angler circles, the people that you do not hear about that are absolute terminators. What sort of things have influenced you, mate? I mean, I, I suppose to take it back quickly, just to the, the real early days. Um, so grew up fishing with my dad. Um, we just used to get our like info from the couple of mags that were out there and you're talking late eighties. So carp world had only, was only a couple of issues deep mm -hmm. that had very little technical stuff in there. And I think there was only like carp fisher. And yeah. There was barely any videos. So it was literally, there was like nothing out there. So you, you just like, you learned for yourself or if you gleaned a couple of tiny little bits from a mag or like something, you, you know, you were quite fortunate really. Um, so yeah, all, all my sort of early days really were, were like that. And cause I fished with my old man, we never really sort of spoke to too many people. We just like fished together and that was that, you know, fish did a night, went home. Yeah. Like, on pretty easy lakes as well. Sandmere, Dovemere, Thornycroft, Whirly, like um, the Isle, them sort of places, you know, catching plenty, singles, doubles, occasional 20, that sort of thing. And then I decided I'd been reading like big carp stories. Um, I'd sort of, I'd seen a few things. I'd like, I just, I, you know, I had this sense that there was like this kind of like wider sort of big carp scene out there that I wanted a piece of just felt really exciting and I wanted to, to, you know, to get involved and go and fish for some of them more difficult fish. Ended up fishing Reedsmere. And, um, but I was still really green. Yeah. Like really green. Do you know what I mean? We had, I, I, st I had like um, an aqua two man dome that me and my dad used to both fish under at that point, uh, which was massive. Uh, Coleman double burner. Yeah. Old Fox bow frame bed chair that weighed a ton big like which would fully zipped hold all you know top to bottom the ones that weigh a ton that sort of thing like rod pod um didn't really have a clue what like proper carp fishing entailed yeah got to reeds me kept myself to myself for the first couple of trips i was a bit like i was only 17 sort of thing and um yeah, just just remember seeing how the lads were operating on there, and like very quickly, I was like, I remember seeing lads walking past me with just like a two rod sling that just had a brolly, two rods. Actually, probably would have had a third rod to be fair, because it would have had a, like a marker stroke spot, like spawn rod or whatever. Um, bed chair in one hand, bucket in the other, single trip. You know, job done. Really stripped down kit. Yeah, straight away I was like, all oh, right, okay. You know, it's taking me two or three trips to get to swims and stuff, and. I was just seeing lads moving all the time and stuff as well. And I just hadn't been seeing that on those other lakes, you know, the, like the well-stocked, you know, kind of like just easy sort of prolific lakes. So I clocked onto that really, really quick. Um, and yeah, little Rob, cause he was a similar sort of age um, as me. I think he'd, or I think he might've already done a season on reeds possibly. Okay. I think before I got there, but maybe just the one, or he'd maybe done a bit that winter or something, but he'd fished Cape Storm before, That's right. which yeah, was yeah. proper lake, really. Only small, but like proper, you know, there was good anglers fishing there. And he was just like light years ahead of where I was at that point. Um, and I remember seeing him around and chatting to him and just remember thinking, fuck, like I need to up my game. <laughs> like I'd, I'm like, I'm just not even, I'm not even in the game here. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not fishing properly and stuff. So like, yeah, he was, he was a, a really big influence um, in them first couple of years. And also because he was a similar sort of age, it was a good yeah. sort of benchmark. If, if you like, you know, the older lads who would have probably been in their like mid twenties, late twenties, early thirties, um, some of the Northwich lads and people like Gary Mitchell and Brian, the minor, Mark, the bull, Stevie Allen, all them sort of lads, Frank, there was like seriously good angers on there. Yeah. They were a bit older. So, you, you know, you took things from them as well. Just, just, just little things, you know, like all sorts of things. It, like I still cast now. My casting style is through watching Scott Day cast um, yeah. in, yeah, in the nineties on Reedsmere. Um, so he's all, holds his rod, like almost vertical above his head with the, with the rig, like hanging back just off the blank, any couple of inches off the blank. Um, and he will wait until it's stopped spinning and it's completely static before lowering it back in one movement and casting. And I picked up on that back then, which was 20 odd years ago. 
and I've cast like that to this day. Um, just little things like that, little rig tweaks, the hook baits and stuff that I used. Again, um, you know, Scott was quite a big influence there as well with the hook baits, the old fizz and harvest, mm. um, some of the other combos like the squid and the mulberry, which really have gone on to be yeah. the three completely dominating flavor combinations still to, to this day, day yeah, yeah, which is mad a bar pineapple, I suppose. But like the citrus one, like fizz and harvest is in that acidic kind of realm, isn't it? Like, but no one was using them back then. You know, them Northern boys were on that, you know, well ahead of the curve really because of Frank. Mm -hmm. So them influences kind of like filter down through the generations, I suppose, when, when you think about it. Um, yeah. just, yeah. I remember seeing lads with these like little pots of their singles and thinking, oh, hey, what's like, yeah, what are these? Or, you know, cause off the shelf, you couldn't like the old Hutchy ones that you could were massive, yeah. like big old, like 20 mil donkey chokers, <laughs> the Hutchy ready-made pop-ups back then. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe you could get like, I think possibly mainline did like one or two in them really early days, but there was barely any bright singles available mm. back then which seems mad now because you could literally go out and choose from like 500 bright singles today. Couldn't you, if you went into yeah. a, a tackle shop. Um, so everyone was rolling their own little bright singles, you know, that as an influence has carried on all the way through. Um, other little things like the lads using, um, they used to all put, uh, well, I say all, a lot of them used to use Balakan in the hemp. Yes. Which again, back then was like well ahead of the curve. And I'd heard this little whisper of like, and this word, I didn't recognize it because it's an odd name, isn't it? Yeah. And people say it in different ways. It's like Belacan, Belachan. That's it. Bela I've heard people Bela say like, Belachan. And like, I, I was like, well, like, what is it? And it took me ages to find it. And then, like, I made my mum take me to um, like a Chinese food store yeah. in Manchester, like tracked it down and then started making this like horrendous smelling like yeah. salty hemp, but like incredibly good. But again, this is like 97, 98. So I mean, what probably 15 years before anyone started selling it commercially, mm, at um, least. sort of, so, you know, you had stuff like that, the bright singles, um, even the rigs, like, you know, like the lads were using choddies, um, yeah. in the late nineties again, cause of Frank, Frank short rig, yep. which was well before Terry started using his Inch, variation yeah. on the, on, on the choddy. So, yeah, there was loads of influences from them early days, but also just seeing like, I would probably say the main one is just the effort that lads used to put in, you know, like watching how little Rob operated and how he fished and his level of observation, like literally all day long from dawn till dusk, looking at the lake, really, do you know what I mean? Just that level of observation and seeing a few rapping and be moved. Um, yeah. Seeing that, that's stuck with me ever since it was like a really quick learning curve there. It didn't take long to pick up on those things. And I was like, right, that's how I need to operate. I remember going home, spread all my kit out on the lawn uh, at my house. And literally I like looked at everything. I was like, do I really need this? Can I make it lighter in any way? And I'd be yeah, like, yeah. do I need it? I'd be like, no, well, I was going to stay at home. Do I need this? No. All, all, all the way down to um, my own hooking mat. I took the, I took the inner out of it. Um, and the first couple of reeds carp, um, well, actually, sorry, no, it wasn't the first couple I caught. It was after that. Um, the first couple that I caught, I had this pitifully thin one. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, and I caught the big and um, my first bite from Reed's Mirror was the big mirror called Single Scale. Jeez. Uh, it was about, I was about 10 nights in, caught single, but I still had this like really piss thin little mat. And I remember having it on the mat thinking, I really need a better mat because it was the first 30 pounder I'd caught. Do you know what I mean? I'd never put a 30 pounder on a mat. I yeah, didn't really yeah, know what it was going to look like. It was just like my little noddy mat for fishing like Sam here, putting 10 pounders on really. Bit um, of a step up here. Yeah. So anyway, like a little bit later down the line, I got one of Jamie Smith's CP mats, yeah, yeah. but they got the Velcro on the side and you, they used to get so heavy when they got wet because yeah. he just used to put a bin bag taped together. So when it got wet, the phone <laughs> was weigh like 20 kilos or Looking something. Looking that around. So I took the foam out. I just used to roll the mat up. And when I caught one, I put my sleeping bag inside it in a dustbin uh. bag. So yeah, stuff like that. So I went through everything in my rucksack, you know, yes, no, 
as light as I could, put it all on my back in my back garden. I was like, shit, that's still really heavy. <laughs> Emptied it all out again. I was like, how can I make this lighter? You know what I mean? So, but I mean, yeah, most of the lads on there, were. it was like eating super noodles, you know, like one little light pan, super noodles, um, you know, just like uh, coffee mate, whitener, instead of taking yeah. milk, small water bottle, like everything was stripped to them because you cart barrows didn't even exist then no, no. Yeah, again which seems mad but like and also because of all the styles and the plowed fields and all that like if you'd have had a barrow you'd have had to unload it two or three times to get to the meadow swims it's changed now i think on there and, and you can barrow around it and stuff back then you had to walk it's a fucking nightmare <laughs> like it's like some of the walks were massive and i was getting dropped off because i didn't yeah, have a car you got nothing, i'm dad dropping me off so I'd like just be dumped at the gate on like a 40 odd, 45 acre lake or whatever it is. Um, and if I wanted to be like on the new bank, it was probably like an hour walk with your kit or whatever. Um, so yeah, all them kind of influences from the early days, like say observation, Warcraft, yeah. lightening your kit down, the little bright ones. You've got some angles on there as stuff. well, haven't you, to pick all that up from? It was an incredible, yeah, like when you yeah. look at what they've all gone on to do yeah. as well, you know, they've all ended up really in like significant bits of the industry really uh especially lads like scott and sean do you know what i mean they're yeah. they've been in charge of a lot of the product development at fox for a long time smashed it those boys yeah definitely. yeah um yeah and and there was just a lot of other really really good anglers as well that you know have never written and have never publicized anything and have just you know been just as successful as everyone else but they just did their thing and Kept it quiet. You know, yeah, that was exactly. that. I think, yeah, that, that, that Northwest scene did kick a lot of good anglers out. Obviously, Miles Gibson a couple of years yeah. after, after us. Um, it's done, yeah, it's done a lot, hasn't it? Yeah. And it, even since, you know, lads like Adam Biddulf and stuff yeah. coming up through there now. I think it's just one of them lakes. Yeah. Trains, it's, it's a you melting know, it pot. trains you hard. But also, it's a melting pot, place. isn't it? You, you, you're a certain, sure, yeah. a certain type of angler that takes that on and stays with that fishing consistently. Do you know mm. what I mean? Especially yeah. with now, what else is on offer in in a relative locality mm-hmm. to that? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I, you hit the nail on the head, actually, that mm. same melting pot. Because like, if I'd have gone onto a different lake that was really quiet and I wasn't surrounded by all them sort of lads, my progression would have been mm. like so much slower. But, you know, kind of because I'd have... Frank Warwick there, you know, Martin Allison that side, Little Rob that side, Bry Forshaw over there. Because you were seeing what was going on, you couldn't fail to... Yeah, drink it in. Yeah, to just, to you know, just everything just from watching like how lads baited up to how they cast to the sort of, you know, um, just like everything about what they were doing. What about modern really? day? What about modern day? Influences modern for you? Modern day influences. <clears throat> um... <coughs> I mean, I suppose really in recent times, I would say Samir's probably got to actually be one of my biggest influences. Mm-hmm. Just purely because of how he approaches and thinks about his carp fishing. You know, um, just his like thirst for freedom and yeah. just chasing the buzz and, you know, not sitting somewhere for the sake of it because it's a prestigious carp or whatever just to go and wake up in incredible places and, you know, soak it all in and catch amazing carp, you know, in the peace and quiet. Like I said, just this sense of adventure, I just think is inspiring. Mm. Like, you know, even just him getting his bike, I went to meet him. So he kept, I mean, who else would fly from Spain to London, get a train from London to Southampton to pick up um, a road bike, that you've had posted to a tackle shop in Southampton. Mad, mad, mad. He then jumped in my van with me and we went on a like mystery tour around Southampton buying gloves, a memory card, like other bits of shit that he needed. We then went for a pizza and then he rode back to Spain, <laughs> just set off into the night on this bike that he'd literally never ridden. He's mad, isn't he? With new kit that he'd literally just ripped the tags off and put on. He's like, fuck it, let's go. I love it, mate. I love him and Claire it's incredible. Like, just going off grid and just living Amazing. wherever and doing. Oh, it's ridiculous. Love it. Love, he's like he's got such a phenomenal work ethic that people don't see off camera. You know, they see the films, see all the amazing carp, and he puts together his films in this beautiful, seamless way that you know that he does. And but it doesn't show the grit and the work that goes into all of that. 
and it's yeah. phenomenal. It's like a whirlwind. Like the couple of times that I've been with him, um, I've just absolutely loved it. I've absolutely loved it. Like I'd love to do a bit more of that. Like when I, like I've been burning a bit this spring cause it's been a b- bit busy and this, that and the other. And I've been speaking to him and he's just like, bro, I've just book yourself a ticket. Just yeah. get down here. So he's like, we'll, we'll get, you know, and, and he's just that attitude, just like, fuck it. You're only here once, whatever you want to do, make it happen, do it. Yeah, definitely. You know, and, and um, I remember actually the second trip we ever went on, um, we were sat down in the Pyrenees somewhere. We didn't film that one. We should have done because it was a mega trip actually, but we didn't film it. Um, uh, and this was when he was still, we still had the garage and all this and right. the other. And we we were just chatting about like, he was like, oh, what do you reckon about the possibility of, um, you know, he's like, do you reckon I could do some, you know, sort of European you know, guided trips and tuitions. And, this, and he was talking about the van, and but it was all just ideas, just like embryonic ideas. And we chatted about it for a good few days. Um, and I actually sent him um, this mag, like this really cool journal. I can't remember what it's called now, but it's basically about like van lifers. Okay. Cool, like off-grid van setups and this, that and the other, like mad trips to like you know, God knows where. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually sent him a copy. And then six months later, like I'm, uh, it, it wasn't that that was the catalyst, but just no, no, no. Y- uh, you know, kind of his the way that happens so quickly. Do you know what I mean? He's got he's like got this life. He's been doing it for twenty five years. Six months later, he's just rethought it all in his head and just thought, I don't have to do this anymore. Yeah, I can make this happen, and just to just to go and do it. I just think that that spirit is 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 incredible. Um, and also just the fact that nothing is ever, he's like never dooming about anything ever. It doesn't matter how fucked everything gets, how broken everything is, how difficult it is, how wet it is, how cold it is, how hot it is. Yeah. He still makes the best of it, just laughs it off and gets on with it, which I love as well. Yeah, that he is something is, else, isn't he? Yeah, force of nature. Um, but yeah, so Samir, um, who else would I say? Um, probably just a couple of my other mates as well. Like not necessarily people you'd know, like lads like Elmo. Yeah. Um, just purely influential in terms of the way that like fishing is absolutely on his own terms. Like if he's feeling it, he goes, if he's not feeling it, he just doesn't go. He's, he's there's no commitments to anyone. He's got no contractual obligations. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He just goes fishing when he wants. And again, he just fishes in like little, Best. Short little short spells, yeah, four, five, six weeks baiting, and then that'll be it. He, you know, won't go again for a while, and and just also how he feels about it as well. Like he's just got no interest in fishing for in fishing the circuit waters for no ones sitting in amongst the crowds. Yeah, he's just got no interest. I find that really inspiring as well. Yeah, so I think I'm I I'm like I'm. Unf- unfortunately it's not the right word but like i have to consider these days whether the fish that i'm catching i can publicize um and i do do i have got a little no publicity um syndicate that i go and do a bit on and stuff but i know that i can't i can't go and do like a whole year on there week in week out It'd be lovely mm. have the loveliest time catch loads it'd be great <laughs> but i couldn't i couldn't you know provide any pictures or content for anyone so you know, I know that I've got to fish places where I can, you know, I can. So, but yeah, obviously Elmo just does what he wants, where he wants. And, you know, so I take, I take a bit of influence, I think from that as well. He's always just a really good one for a leveler as well. If ever you're feeling a bit burnt about anything, like right. he's, he's a great one for just being positive about stuff. Like always a positive spin yeah. on, on everything. Always positive. You need those people, mate. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think... It's really nice when you've got mates that you can um, bounce that back to as well. Do you know what I mean? Um, And I think like I've, again, the older I get, I feel like I've only, I only want to surround myself with them sort of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you buzz off and that you get that spark from and that you, do you know what I mean? Um, I get it, mate. Yeah. The future for you guys, you've obviously got your book in hopefully. Yeah, really excited about that. Uh, mate, I think it'd be brilliant just hearing this and talking to you probably for the first time in depth. It's definitely different to what I 
perceived in terms of your angle and stuff. So I'm interested to read the book and well, see I've tried to, the ins and outs, mate. Just, I've tried to write it really honestly, like, and, 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 and as it happened and to put stuff in context, mm. like a sort of real life context as well. Like, like I say, cause often I haven't really done that many nights a year. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, hopefully it'll be, it'll be relatable because over the years I've seen people at shows and stuff like that. And they'd be like, well, you fish full time, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And I'd be like, no, I'm a secondary school art teacher. And they'll be like, this was a few years ago. Obviously I've done a few podcasts and stuff now where I've talked about work and stuff, but, yeah. but like when I was teaching, like I never, because of the nature of teaching, obviously I didn't have any social media through them years as well. Mm. Um, cause you, you can't have open social yeah, yeah. media, of course, obviously because of, uh, you know, security and privacy issues around teaching and all the rest. So I was like, I was like separated from all that. Um, yes, I think lads just used to think that because you're a sponsored angler, yeah. I think there's sometimes an assumption that you just fish full time. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, hopefully it'll be, hopefully it'll be relatable and, be good, um, mate. like South thoroughly enjoyed writing it because even though I have written lots of bits over the years, I've pulled it all together. I've like rewritten lots of it. A lot of it had been watered down a bit for the mags as well. So yeah, of course. it was a little bit more PC. So I've kind of put the full on, you know, like the real shit that I happened like in, um, you know, or just stuff where a bit of stuff was a bit naughty or this. It's just the, it's just truth as yeah, opposed yeah. to a slightly more edited, edited version. Um, so yeah, I've, like I say, most of it I'd, I'd not seen or read for you know five ten fifteen years some of it because some of it was from quite a long time ago so yeah yeah, it's been really nice sitting down and kind of going through it all again and um yeah yeah it's been great so yeah with a bit of luck hopefully that'll be out this sort of late autumn fishing wise bit of luck. future uh so um hopefully hopefully one or two more from stonies this autumn okay if i can string it together nice hopefully sort of the plan is to go back on there early september i think do like september october on there um and then hopefully have a european trip or two in the autumn um but i don't know possibly the alps possibly spain nice. maybe probably end up having to go if it's late if it's november i'll have to go south to get chase the sun chase the sun a little bit um and then I think next year I'm just going to do some slightly more laid back English fishing. That's not that I don't get, you yeah, know, yeah. headlong into um, perhaps just, there's a couple of local waters and stuff that I could just drop on and the odd work night or whatever, just to sort of keep, you know, um, keep me entertained, I suppose, if you like, I think probably just go back to a few European trips next year. Nice. I think. And then in amongst it, filming commitments, TA. Yeah. Bits and bobs. Yeah. Just works, for TA. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, nothing um, for SIP this year or next year. That was quite, it was quite a lot of commitment really. And yep. up being that sort of, yeah, it's a good bunch of extra filming over yeah, the yeah. course of a year with other stuff and that as well. So yeah, drop that out for this year. Um, still got to do an underwater one, I think, hopefully with them though, which I'm looking forward to. Oh, nice. Um, we did have it planned in for last year. So the one that Stokesy did, um, yes. that should have been me. Oh, that should have been me. Should have been me. Uh, well, it was really tough. So actually, it really tough, I'm, yeah. glad it, I'm glad it wasn't. But yeah, basically, it was some miscommunication and planning, basically. And um, um, I was away. Okay. I can't remember where I was. So, or I like only had a couple of nights and they needed the week, basically. So, um, so you were in for the next round. So I'm in just in for the next. They just flipped it, basically. Got yeah. Tom to do that one and I'm going to do the next one, hopefully. Not Wicked. sure where or what, but yeah. That is um, a brain scratcher, mate. Yeah, looking forward to that. Um, looking forward to that. I, 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 th I think some of the boat observation stuff will hopefully have come in handy, like from what I've seen. I was in casting rigs, going out there looking at how they sit. Yeah, I've done a bit of that now, so I know that they sh it should all be sat sweet. Yeah, um, I'm sure it will be, mate. You'd be right. Yeah, yeah, uh, and then yeah, like in in all honesty, mate, I think just a couple of quieter years on the sort of um the, the the kind of like yeah the content front yeah fair days i think well um, gaz mate i can't thank you enough for coming in mate um i've really enjoyed this chat it's been the first time i sent significant time talking to you mate and i've had a i've had a real good insight into i think some of the preconceptions that i may have had about you before 
being a bit different, mate, in a very positive way, though, mate. Well, hopefully. It's and been nice you... to talk about some different stuff as well. No, it's been brilliant. I've mm. really enjoyed it. Before you go, you've got to answer some quick fire questions. Oh, though, yes. Mate. Sorry. You're not prompted Far away. in any way or form. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. <laughs> you ready? Yes. I love this. Yeah. Only fish for wrong uns or never go fishing again, mate. Can I river fish for like roach and grayling? And mate, stuff? only fish for wrong uns or never go fishing again, mate. Oh, man. What do you classify as a wrong one, though? Well, Sorry, it's not very quick fire, this, is it? what you classify as a wrong one. I mean, I would only classify... Right, this is, this is this is good, actually. I would only classify, really, a wrong one as a stolen carp from another country that's been dropped in a lake big. Okay, so you really, can only fish for I don't them. think, like, do you know what I mean? Simos, whatever. Like, I, like as long as they've grown in this country... Um, I don't think they are. Right, so it's not grown in this country. It's been brought over. Let's say Never go legally, fishing again. Never go fishing again. If it was like a 45 pound... What was if it was I, no, I'm not going to like... But I don't want to black mark like anything. Uh, Even in, if it was legally particular. brought over. Yeah, but it was like 45 pound that's been brought over from like yeah. Eastern Europe and dropped in like fed on pellet. No, I just wouldn't go fishing again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, three celebrities you'd take fishing. I like this would be a good one. Three celebrities. Yeah, because I think you go out the box with these celebrities. I don't Jeez. think you go straight down the line with this. Um, uh, there can be past Christina up, Aguilera. Christina Aguilera. Shakira. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is more the conventional way that I thought. Uh, was, and it? Chris Yates. Oh, what an eclectic mix of people. Incredible hair in this social. Yeah. Some of the best hair I've ever... They'd all sit down for it? a curry together, wouldn't they? Oh, yeah. And Christina, mate, get the chaps on and we'll be off. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, dirty hair. Right? <laughs> well, you know it. Um, drum and bass or country and western, mate? <laughs> drum and bass. Uh, what's your idea of carp fish in hell? Hell? Mm. Um, a perfectly manicured swim with uh, a lake map that tells me the wraps that I need to fish to. Oh, that's heaven. Absolutely <laughs> perfect. Get on the spot. So, sorry. Um, um, yeah, is that yeah. it? You can have it to yourself, empty, full of people. You'd have it full of people, wouldn't you, as well? That sorry, what's that? Tell. You'd have it full of people as well, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, a really tell. busy, yeah. A really busy, perfectly manicured lake with, with wraps to fish to, yeah. <laughs> uh, best piece of advice you've been given? Just don't sweat any of it, just have fun with it. Don't take any of it too seriously, just have fun. Nice. Uh, one angler to catch a carp to save your life right here, right now. Um... I'd, I'd probably say Miles. Miles Gibson. Do, because I think out of everyone, Miles is possibly, other than Daryl, yeah. uh, I think they're probably both incredibly um, versatile with what they can do. Very nice. You know, be that big uns, you know, big lakes, small lakes, rock yeah. hard ones. What, yeah. Good answer. Yeah. Good answer indeed. I mean, probably predictable. You say predictable, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, written word I mean, or video, mate? Oof. What are you going for? I have to say written word. You do like writing, don't you? Good writer as well. Yeah, I love it. Like we said before, I just think it's because, don't get me wrong, I watch loads of video as yeah. well. Not just fishing, but like other stuff. Um, but I just, I love the way reading, just these days, the way like so much of what we do is a bit hectic and is digital. I, I quite enjoy reading being a nice quiet hour or so like yeah. away from that. Um, and I like the way, you know, imagination, your own imagination plays a part in crafting what you're reading. Fair dues. Uh, one carp you wish you'd caught, mate. The Black Mirror did fish for it, but it went, it spent, yeah, it, it died the year I fished it, spent the spring on there. Um, yeah, wish I'd. I went back to Yateley basically uh, for the start. The plan was to go back to the Mere later that year. But I was just going to go and have a go for the baby orange, basically, yeah. um, and which I which I did catch. But but yeah, I sort of and I I was kind of not close, but like stuff was starting to happen. I'd seen stuff like it was you know I'd been close a couple of times that spring. Yeah, just that's the thing. You never know, do you? You never know what's around the corner. You never know what's coming. Um, Briggsy, the last person to catch it, wasn't he? Was Briggsy the last? I'm person? not sure. He might have been. I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> don't know. Well, um, but yeah, you'd have caught it eventually, mate. Definitely, that one. I reckon. I don't uh, know. 
Final question, mate. Night out on the bank or a night in with the missus? Which one are you taking? <laughs> uh, it was a long pause. It's so hard, these, aren't they? You can't have one without the other, can you? What do you mean? <laughs> You've got a choice. One night. <laughs> I didn't ask you the surfing, this um, just, biking, fishing no. question. Uh, this is brilliant. Can I take the missus with me on the bank? Uh, I mean, that's a cop out, no. Of course you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> what are you going for here, guys? Come on. Uh, this is the most thought you've put into anything. <laughs> Planning this podcast. It's a tough one. <laughs> Mate, that's the whole point it's of the question. It's a tough one. Will she listen to this? Is what you got to think about? No. So it's definitely them fishing. No, but I, I, I'm actually trying to like rationalise it oh, genuinely. Yeah. All right, nice. I could have just given like an off, yeah, a, a, a night out. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. So he sacked That's off fishing. He sacked the... off the missus. He's on a lad's night out. Going to boys. Ah, night in with the missus. Yeah, good save. That's, that's yeah. class. Uh, Gaz, uh, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you guys Thanks for watching and listening. I'll be back soon with another podcast. Until then, Gaz Barham, you're a legend, mate. Cheers. <laughs>